Thank you, Lord. You. Hi, Pastor Don. How are you? I knew the room was anointed. I could feel it. <laughs> Amen. You guys really doing good? I've been feeling in my mind like I'm on the same topic way too long, but I, I think we're okay. You guys all right? Yes. Talking about the same stuff too much, or are you all right? Oh, no. Okay, because it kind of spreads out a little bit and covers some other stuff too. But because I haven't even, I, I do want to, I do want to, just by faith, do me a favor, by faith, turn to Hebrews 10. <laughs> uh, but there's, there's two quick questions that have this, they're in this same line, so we won't go. I, I held the other ones. Uh, there was a question on healing and anybody on the internet just that's listening that's that's online on school online if, if you have healing questions we are going to cover healing in this school I promise we are going to take a long time and just cover it so if you can just even for now hold your questions on healing because if I try to answer them from the class it'll just take me into a, open some stuff that's going to be hard to come back and there's a, just a timing for it I want to I really want to cover these foundational truths see you live from the place of righteousness I honestly believe a lot of reasons we struggle and have so many questions in healing is because we haven't settled this first things first topic yeah. because a lot of questions we ask wouldn't be we wouldn't be asking them if we understood some of these foundational things like why am I going through this why is this happening to me that's the reaction of people when they're in trouble and they don't understand. We don't understand we're in a war. We don't understand that there's things of the flesh. There's all kinds of stuff. But it has nothing to do with God. God's not administratively playing charades. He, he is out in the open giving us His Son, His promise, His word and life through the Spirit of God. Amen? So God's come out like He is. So He's not a mystery anymore. The mystery's revealed in that sense. So, uh, but, but this is a good question. It's from Shannon in Virginia, Richmond. Uh, she said, is it faith? She said, I've been listening to teachings. We've been, we've been changed already and et cetera, et cetera. But she's asking a question and, and uh, she, was, she was reviewing the material the last few days on faith and was wondering, is it faith that makes us righteous or is it the salvation that, that, that Jesus has brought? Well, that's an interesting question. It's actually, we're saved. The salvation that he provided, we're saved by grace through faith. So to answer your question, Shannon, it's both. Your faith is what brings the revelation of righteousness to be in your life. You're, all, you're, you're made righteous through Christ. God sees your life through Jesus Christ and everyone, but it's by faith that you walk in that righteous revelation. In other words, you can live in condemnation, you could sell it short, you could say yeah, but, and come up with a one-liner that absolutely aborts the revelation of your righteousness. Does that make sense? Salvation is the same way. You're saved by grace through faith. So there's a working, a supernatural working of God's power that opens up your understanding and a revelation to the finished work of Christ. But it's faith that takes you there. Amen. Do you see that? So, and the other question, it was, uh, it's a really good one. Uh, you said, I've, it, I've been listening. This is, uh, I, I hope I'm saying it right, Alec. And... Uh, yeah, from Seattle, Washington. So, that's good. So, thanks for doing this school. Revealing forgotten or hidden truth that's not seeming to be preached. That's amazing. I have heard you say during preaching, but I don't understand the difference between the two. That God loves me and being loved by God. Let me explain it. That's a good question. Theologically, theologically I'm correct to, to say to this whole school and to everybody in the world, God loves you. There's a difference between me saying God loves you and you receiving the love of God. Big difference. So when I say being loved by God, it means receiving that love. Letting that love actually have place in your life and heart and, and mark your identity. Being loved by God. The Bible says, Jesus says in John 14, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Well, that sounds, that sounds legalistic if you listen to it in a, in a law ear. But what he's saying is, when you love me, you'll just walk in agreement with me. The fact that you love me, you'll just walk in agreement with me. You'll find yourself doing what I do because you love me. <laughs> now, if you read that in the legalistic ear, you'll go, oh my God, I got to prove I love God. I got to do everything I'm supposed to do and say, see, I love you. See, I love you. And if you're doing that, you're not receiving God's love in the process. 
But here's what it says. It says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And it says, you will be loved, verb. You will be loved by the Father. Isn't that cool? Oh, I don't know about you, but but I don't need you to just say, hey, Dan, God loves you. I want to be loved by the Father. That means that grace touches my heart, that I know my place in Him, that I have peace in me with God, and that, that everything is just good, and God's letting me know that on the inside. By faith, I'm believing He loves me. You see what I mean? And by faith, when I believe that, there's a grace that comes to make that my reality. Okay? Please understand that you live by faith. There's another question. I'm not sure. I don't know that I can. Yeah, okay. This is good. This will help the whole school. This one I was going to hold, but I'm not. It's from the United Kingdom. It's Tim. Tim, I'm going to just try to answer what you're saying here. And, and I hear, and he said, it's, it's neat how he said, he said, I'm trying to ask this question in the right way so you sense my heart. Because he's not frustrated and he's not. But he, sa- he says something here that's amazing. And we, I was just talking with one of the students that, that actually said they were believing the same thing or feeling the same thing when I first started teaching the school here. They, they said they actually were thinking in their mind, well, this is just for Dan. This is a special, re- this is just a revelation he has. This is for him. No, it's for everybody. And, but but here's, here's what he said. Uh, you are who you are because you are in Christ, but you have had encounters with God that have been, have encounters that have uh, been revealed from the Father. And without that, all you'd have is Bible knowledge. Well, that's, that's true. But here's the deal. We're not pursuing Bible knowledge. I'm not reading my Bible to know my Bible. I'm reading my Bible to know Him. So in my personal relationship with God, my communion with God, there's a place of interaction and interface and intercourse with the Lord where those revelations come freely. They really do. It has to do with perspective and mindset. So I'm not just reading my Bible. And we're going to get more. This is why I'm trying to hit this foundation on righteousness so strong so that as we lead into communing with God, no one in this room has any any setback in communing with him because you have every right to be with him and that's why we're taking so much time I know on righteousness so that God sees that he wants you in his presence and here's what happens is if we start believing and I'm addressing you Tim personally but the whole school because there's a lot of other folks that feel this way because you can start believing and get rigid with this and think well if God hey well until God touches me with a revelation I really can't know that he's real and I'm just going to at least do the best I can one of these days he might choose to touch me that way or, or you can do like this fellow did, which your heart is, is hungry and sincere and amazing. He's, he's been on 40-day fasts. He's, he's been extensive praying in tongues, trying to hear the voice of God and, and get revelation from the Lord. You just have to be careful that you don't get your identity so infringed on that you begin to strive for things that come by grace through faith. Because when you start believing, it's so critical. When you start believing, I don't hear the voice of God. Now you're on a struggle journey for 20 years. And all the time, I don't hear the voice of God. Well, I don't hear the voice of God. See, I don't hear the voice of God. I don't hear. You see what I mean? Rather than communion. Father, I thank you that you speak to me. Father, I thank you that when I read your word, my heart comes alive. See, this is what we're not being taught. Communion with the Lord. Faith. Confession, faith. Father, I thank you that you absolutely love me. And my ears are open to hear. And the hearing ear, according to Proverbs, is from the Lord. And the seeing eyes of the Lord. Thank you, I'm not blind. And thank you, Lord, my heart is in agreement with you. And if I seek you, I find you. If I draw near, you draw near to me. And I thank you, Father, for the grace in my life to cause me to recognize and hear your voice. Even in the midst of chaos. Even in the midst of pandemonium. I thank you, I have the ability to hear your voice on the inside. And everything I sow into me... I thank you, Father, comes alive by your spirit in every time of need. I thank you that I can know you. See, you can pray that way when you're believing at the same time, I don't hear God's voice like I should. Well, you start opening up your heart to say, I know you're speaking to me and I know you want me to hear you and I thank you, Mom, in position. Thanks for fathering me. Thanks for loving me. Because what happens is you identify yourself based on what you're not or don't have. That becomes you, and it's like trying to fight your way out of a bag. It's the same way with peace. People come to the altar for peace, and they're kneeling, and they're weeping. They're weeping. And they're so feeling no peace. And then people gather around because we love each other. 
And we're like, what's wrong, honey? And we say, I just don't have peace. I need the touch of peace in my life. And this person has been struggling for years, feeling no peace and feeling no peace. And we're, so, so we feel like the right Christian thing to do. And there's times where God, who knows there's times where God will just go and breathe peace over somebody. Who knows he'll do that? But what people need to know is I have peace with God. I have to start there. I'm not trying to find a surface peace. I'm not just trying to feel a peace. I have to know in my heart and pursue by sometimes raw faith, I have peace. If I perceive that somebody's been on a long search for peace, and this might be the sixth time in the fourth church, they've been at an altar looking for peace. Who knows people do that? And then they'll go to a conference and they'll know there's another speaker and a different, and that anointing hasn't touched me. And maybe God will drop peace in me if they pray for me. They seem pretty peaceful. Maybe there'll be an impartation. And we start getting our eyes on just getting getting it this way. And then now you're pulling yourself so far from the walk of faith that you're conditioning yourself that unless I feel peace right now, I have no peace. See, that's what starts happening. And that's what I mean by living sensual and getting driven sensual. Because here's what happens. These two or three uh, sweet people come. Who's ever prayed for somebody that was struggling emotionally and after you prayed it didn't seem like they really got fulfilled in that emotional deficit? Who's ever done that? Me too, right? And and, and you're like, oh, and you just want them to be like, whoo, ah, (laughs) Jesus. You know what I mean? But you pray over them. And who knows as you pray and you see more tears than before. For. Why? Because as you're praying, their mind's already working against faith and they're saying, well, here we go again. It ain't working. I don't know why God won't give me peace. Why won't God let me feel peace? How come I have no peace? And all of a sudden, this thing, this belief just becomes a stronghold in their mind and they're just waiting for the day God just, oh. What you've got to teach, I was at an altar in Oklahoma and a lady came up to me, very known in the area, very loved and respected probably shouldn't even mention where I was. I forget all this video stuff. <laughs> ah, well, anyhow, she comes up. I can tell the story. I'm okay. I was just looking for permission. I'm okay. And she came up to me, and you perceive things. You're not judging. You perceive things. God shows you things. She said, I, Sir, I just need you to pray for me. I know you're the one that needs to pray for me. So her language gave something away a little bit out of her heart. And I realized that she's been in this place where I've been a Christian my whole life and I have never felt the love of God. And it was building an edge in her heart that was not good. It was was almost creating now a frustration even though she's known as serving the Lord, having this ministry, people come to her for counsel. It's always true. And she looked at me and she said, I just need you to lay your hand on me and pray for me so that I can finally feel the sense of God's love. And I said, honey, I won't do you that in service. It's exactly what came out of my heart. Now see, I would be axed in most people's circles right there. Because the most compassionate thing you could do then is lay your hand on her so God goes... Not at all. Because she's saying, I need to feel this thing has been a long strategy of a stronghold that's frustrating her and and keeping her from living by faith and truth. It's going to drive her to live sensual manifestations. So she feels that little sense of love. And and I honestly, I don't believe God even wanted me. I don't even believe she would have. But let's just say she gets some, even an emotion, even just we just get some sense of where she feels like, well, you know, I do feel, I feel a little better. Yeah, I feel a little. See, it's a place for her to get alone. The best thing she can do, and I've counseled her and talked to her in this, and she was frustrated with me. Because she didn't want me to encourage her in faith. She just wants God to come and blast her. And if God doesn't come and blast her, she's frustrated. And I said, honey, I pulled her aside and got alone with her. I said, you're being deceived. I said, you have every privilege. I said, this is a stronghold it's building in you. How many times have you been prayed for for this topic right here? She said, I couldn't even begin to tell you. I said, honey, this isn't your journey. Your journey is getting alone with him and saying, thank you for your love for me. 
Thank you that you sent your son to die so I can live, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, you approach God by faith. You are loved by God. I said, you believe God's love. You just believe it and let that be enough that Christ came and died for you. I shared 1 John 4. In this love is made manifest. The word manifest doesn't mean, the word manifest means seen and known, revealed. Who knows that in that revealing there could be a stewardship of who? Because I feel that way half the time. <laughs> so I'm not against the who. But if I don't have that who, I'm not lacking anything unless I don't see you love me. You get it? That's where you start. And when you lay a foundation of faith there and believe that, who knows that God can give you a stewardship of any kind of manifestation because it'll be healthy then. It'll hit the mark. So uh, I told her I wouldn't do her that injustice. So this this question that that Tim is sharing here, I just want to encourage Tim and anybody to continue in this place of faith. I honestly don't believe scripturally that God is holding out for years and years and years to touch your heart with a revelation. I believe sometimes it's the approach we take, we get to striving, we start labeling ourselves as dull ear, dull senses, Uh, there's frustration that can come in, Uh, there's some things we need to call dead, even that we take personal and say, you know what, why am I frustrated? I'm alive, I have eternal life, my sins are forgiven, why am I taking it personal and weighing it, have to be careful we don't weigh and compare ourselves among ourselves. Why don't I hear the voice of God like you do? Well, I want to be like you. People come up to me after I go to a church for a weekend. I want what you've got. And I say, you have it. (laughs) Every time. It's what I I say, you have it. They'll say, lay your hands on me, please. I want what you want. Lay your hands on me. I say, well, I can lay my hands on you and bless you, but you have what I have. He died once for all. You have exactly what I have. There's just some things I'm seeing that maybe you're not seeing right now, but if you'll start here, You'll run well, and then I'll give them encouragement. Because I know, I know my journey in that. I, I know that there was times I opened my bedroom door and went in there, and I didn't necessarily feel like, oh, I'm going to go meet with God. I said, no, you're going to go meet with God. And I felt like doing something else, and I felt like, you know, going here or doing this, and I thought, no, right now. And I knew I was right with God, and it wasn't a works to me, but I thought, you know what, the greatest thing I could do is know Him more. I'm going to not go here or do this right now. I'm going to go in this bedroom because I want to know you more. Amen. And sometimes I would just tell myself, bless, you're going in there. And they were some of the greatest experiences I've had with the Lord when I said, flesh, you're going in there. And my flesh is like, yeah, but, you know, and you just read three chapters this morning and you already prayed. But you just, you can do this. You got to do this. Well, you got to get this done. And I was like, flesh, you know, right now my spirit man's saying, I want to sit on your lap, Father. I want to know. I want to look into your face. And my flesh is going, Dan, you already did. I'm talking the, a personal, a, you know, set apart thing. And then I would just take my flesh right in there. It was just fun. And that was all by faith. So I understand. And when I went in there, a lot of times God met me with amazing encounters because it was straight up faith. You see what I'm saying? So I understand that whole journey. So if you just look at my life, like, and and, and even addressing Tim's question, and you just say, well, you just have special revelation of God or God just gave you. But you 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 might miss out on the fact that I've spent days on end and hours on end just talking to him and receiving his love and thanking him for being so good. You might think God just went zzz, 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 and gave me special favor or something in that. Who knows there's grace and gifting and Christ gives gifts to men, but it's all to reproduce after its own kind. God isn't going to give something to someone and then anoint them to teach it because, and you can't have it. Do you see what I'm saying? Do, do you catch what I'm saying? So, so you have to understand that there was seasons in my life where all I prayed was for revelations of God's love. There was seasons in my life where I turned the clocks to the wall so I didn't even know what time it was. And it's been countless hours in my life where I've developed this communion with God where when I'm driving, I'm just Godward. I'm think, I'm thank you, Lord. You're awesome. I'm communing. I'm running things through my heart and mind and God's there. It's just cultivating this knowing Him. 
okay? So that's what we're inviting you into. Now, you can get rigid in your thinking, get intellectual and say, yeah, well, people did that in the church when I first got saved. People that were Christians for 20, 30 years said, well, he just has a special touch of God. And they didn't understand that I was in a bedroom at a capacity that they had never considered. And they're just writing it off as a special grace. Come on, that could be sidestepping the great privilege of knowing him. You see what I'm saying? Jenny, what's it on your heart? So I just wanted to run through those questions. I'm gonna, that's as much as I'm going to handle them right now, and I'm going to jump into Hebrews 10. You just said something else that was like a big gold nugget. It's all gold, but um, you, the exact words, when you have intercourse with the Lord. And, and I have said that, we have talked to people and, and, and said that in conversation before. It's like, you have to get so close, it's, it's like, it's way beyond, it's, it's like sexual intercourse between two, uh, a husband and a wife when they're, I'm going to be vivid, sweating, and they're stuck together, and nothing can get in between them. And, and that's so valuable, and that's what you're saying, There's really. a communion, okay. right? There's a deep intimacy. But, yeah. and, and I don't know, if it, I think it was agape. I'm pretty sure it was agape. It really means to be, to have intercourse yeah. in, in that respect, you know? And that, that's the part that, that I, what you're saying is, is all that. It's like, it's like walking in the cool of the day. It's like 24-7. It's like nothing can get in between you. And I heard you use that term. It's like, yes, I yeah. so want to point that out. And, and well, I'll bring up a personal wall. prayer in light of what she's saying. I shared it at Global. The first time I taught at Global School, I, uh, I, I was sharing it. I don't share this stuff too often, but I, it just came up in me. And I was talking about communion and things you pray, and the students were on the edge of their seat. And I said, okay, I'm just going to get real with it. I said, this might freak some of you out. I don't know, but I think you guys can handle this. But I said, this is a prayer I've prayed for years. It's coming out of my heart in the bedroom when nobody's looking. And I would, I would, I would say, now see, I don't pray it religiously, and I haven't even prayed it for a while. But there was a season where it was valid in my life, and it had to do with this co-union, communion, inter- intercourse thought. And I would say, Father, I open myself up to you, unreserved and unashamed. Here I am, open up to you, come into me, God, and deposit the seed of who you are. Impregnate me, God, so I can give birth to your will. I would say, and I said, and anything that comes out of me is going to look just like you. Come into me, Lord, and deposit yourself into me. And I would pray that way as a communion thought spiritually. Pretty deep. And it's not weird. And the Spirit of God be all over me. I'm like, <laughs> so my spirit is like this. <laughs> so, so, so I'm about ready to bear down and push. <laughs> and give birth to something. <laughs> all the time. See? <laughs> so, so it's a spiritual thing. <laughs> is the tape running? Is it? Oh. Uh, Okay, Hebrews 10. <laughs> no more questions from Jenny. You do that stuff to me. Stop it. <laughs> no, <I'm kidding. laughs> but it's true. I, I've prayed that many times. Come into me and impregnate me. Come inside of me and touch my spirit and deposit the seed of who you are inside of me and impregnate me, God, with the revelation of your will. That's an intimate prayer, guys. And Nathan, you're not in the room. I'm not saying it to sound spiritual and impress you, see. It's not in the front with a mic stirring up the atmosphere. It's when you're not there and you're not looking and the door's closed and it's just me and Jesus. And he's going, boy, he loves me. He is so open for me. I think I'm just going to come and have my way. (laughs) Do you get it? Because nobody's there. Do you understand the impact of that? It's not for any other reason than to know him. Come on. When nobody's looking, when you have time to be with him and, and you choose a whole bunch of other things, you don't realize you say you're hungry, but how hungry are we? I'm not being condemning right now. I'm saying, get real. Are we seeking his face? Or are we extremely distracted and occupied and we think we're busy? <laughs> Sometimes you can feel busy because you're texting all day. That's just, you just makes you feel busy. You got to, oh, I got to get back to, oh, I got four, I got six messages. Oh my God, my phone's been buzzing for, and all of a sudden you're occupied. You just occupy. 
It's true. Young people hear what I'm saying. I'm not being mean. Some of these things that are in technology today, I believe have a subtle strategy behind them to make you feel very inundated and busy and important and, 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 and needed. It's true. And all of a sudden you have 45 connections today with, and, you know, my, 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 own, my own precious son came to me, lost his cell phone, and, and he said, Dad, man, it's a bummer I lost my cell phone. I had 700 contacts on there. Now I've got to try to reprogram all that back into this new phone. And, 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 it, and it was, he said it in a way where I had 700 contacts. And what it means is you chatted with 700 people through the course of time. It's not that you know 700 people and they know you for who you are. It's, it's, it's taking the place of something. It's superficial. It's very shallow. But we fall into it like quick because of need in our life. And it, and it, and it tries to meet something that only knowing Him can fulfill. In fact, now I'm in trouble because I'm on Hebrews 10. But stay there by faith. <laughs> And I could quote this, but I'm just going to read this in Ephesians 3. I want you, I want, and we're going right back to Hebrews 10. <laughs> I'm just going to make this comment. Don't laugh. It's true. Don't, come on, pull with me. I need agreement here. I need the power of agreement. <laughs> Ephesians 3. Okay. Because we're going to nail this big when we start talking about becoming love here in, in, in the next week or so. Because I want to cover communion with God and becoming love. And I know those things are in the order of the Spirit. Because if you don't settle on your right standing with God and you've been made righteous and get free from sin thoughts, sin consciousness, sin mentality, sin desire, pulling and tugging. If you don't stop believing that you're just prone to sin, well, that's just the way we are, brother. You need to deal with that and stop letting the devil lie to you. You're not waking up being pulled and tugged and shook and shaken. You give yourself to the Lord. You understand what I mean? We're going to hit that hard today. You give yourself to Him. You present the members of your being unto righteousness. Not unrighteousness. It teaches that in the Bible. So, so I, I want to establish that because without that truly established, you honestly won't have the true desire when you're all alone to seek His face. Because you've got other things identifying you, driving you, drawing you, ministering to you, if you will. You see what I'm saying? But when you understand righteousness and you give your heart to righteousness and faith, it actually promotes, stirs up, and instigates the desire to be with Him and know Him. Because you don't love Him first. You don't love God because it's the Christian thing to do. You love God because He first loves you. So what inspires your love response is totally seeing and receiving and wearing His love. And all of a sudden, you're so amazing. I want to hang out with you. Can I just like go with you? Come on, that's the idea. He's God. See, we don't give him that place in our life. We're just trying to do kind of right. No, when he, when I see his love for me, it triggers my heart. The goodness of God changes me. You, you understand? And the biggest trap to many Christians is all these other things that are keeping them from even letting that matter as number one. Who knows that's number one? Receiving the love of God. Who knows that there's a lot of other things that seem super important in our lives? And when you really weigh them and really look at them, they really barely have the strength of the value of the day you're living in. I mean, really, we make them matter. <laughs> Well, if I don't get back to so-and-so, well, if I don't talk to so-and-so, or if I don't do this or that. <laughs> this is so amazing what we have here. I'm telling you, we wouldn't, be, we wouldn't be pulled and tried in so many areas if there wasn't a great root of revelation here. You know, Satan knows just how to tweak and distract. Some of the stuff we give ourselves to, all the, oh, okay, thanks. I was ready to go on a tangent. He said, don't go there. <laughs> Yeah, it's not that it wouldn't have been clear and right. It's just not time to go there. In, in Ephesians 3, Paul, in verse 10, shares the intent of God in sending Christ Jesus and, and revealing the gospel. He, that's amazing to me. 
It, it says that Paul was given this mystery to preach. Christ in us and, and all that and, and Christ to the Gentiles and, and this mystery that has been hidden in 8 and 9 through the ages by God now has been revealed. So he's saying the cat is out of the bag, man. This thing is here to be seen, right? And, and to the intent. Now this is God's intention. To the intent. This is amazing. This is the purpose of God. To the intent that the manifold, many falseted wisdom of God right? Many cited the depth of the wisdom of God would be made known by his people to the principalities and powers in heavenly places. That means that God would thoroughly manifest himself through his church who he created in his image, who had seemed to be fallen and couldn't get up. But God let his son take the fall so he could get us up and breathe spirit back into us. And now we can manifest his glory. So God brought the gospel in the intent that he could cause us to shine and reveal who he is to the world. You get it? Oh, it's incredible. And it says, according to the eternal purpose. So he always created you for this. He always meant this for you, for you to be filled with his spirit, to manifest his nature, to walk in his image and confound the wisdom of the wise and in the face of darkness shine his light. He always made you for that. You've never had a different purpose. God never changed his plan. It's the eternal purpose of God. <laughs> it's who you are and why all wrapped up in one do you get it it's why you have breath today see I've given myself to this that's why I'm passionate I have surrendered made sacrifice the labor of love the patience of hope the work of faith to attain this it's not a works thing faith took me there and, you, and just like Tim said yeah I have a revelation God's breathed on that faith I, I don't see anything else I'm alive for this reason so, so now, and now it's not even hard for me to like, like keep from having an attitude or being angry or selfish or jealous or full of... What? That stuff, that's not even a trial to me. It's been obliterated through this understanding. Was it always that way? I grew into that. I'm more extreme in that than I ever was. Do you get it? So I'm not like this struggling man to stay afloat and thank God he considers me. I've given myself to these things and he's breathed on that and empowered me to live what I could never live if he didn't breathe on that. But the key is I want that. Some of us got to get really real and ask what do we really want? Because some of us still want our right to have a right and say enough is enough. Well, you can go that far, but that's far enough. And, and we have, we have, we have limitations that we still have rights. We still have things in our life that are stopping this great image of God from manifesting on the inside out. We really do. We have sellout prices. We have, we do. Judas said, what will you give me to betray him? And for Judas, it was only 30 pieces of silver. So some of us wouldn't even consider that. But there is some things that we'll do. And there is some things that could happen to us that would stop the image of Christ. Where we would take occasion for the flesh and say enough's enough and stand for our rights. You have to get to the place where you're dead, where you get alone with God and say, you know what? The best I understand, I don't even want a right. I don't have a right except to manifest who you are. The intent of you creating me was to manifest your image, then what would I live for anything else for? Why would I covet this life and take advantage of it and start living for other things and just pursuing other things apart from you first? That way, if you're first, then everything else I pursue is in the light of you and it'll never get goofy and muddy and funny. Are you following me? It's very passionate. I'm talking extremely passionate and militant today. And it's not on purpose, it's just the way we just, I, I didn't plan on this. But you have to understand that the intent, listen to the language, the intent of God sending the gospel is to make known his manifold wisdom through your life to the world you live in and the powers that seem to control it. So your life becomes a testimony, a conviction, a judgment to the powers of darkness. 
<gasps> and all of a sudden, everywhere they look, they see Christ in us. <gasps> because we're surrendered, sold out, and filled with the Spirit of God. And our integrity is squeaky clean. Our motives are super pure. And we see God. You get it? Yeah. Come on, it's called a Christian. <laughs> We kind of thought a Christian goes to church and sings happy songs and then does his best to live kind of good. <laughs> oh, God. Are you guys all right in my two boot, boot camp this morning? Because I'm feeling boot campy. <laughs> it's all right. You sweat a little in boot camp and get a little exasperated and stretched and your muscles hurt. and Boot camp trains you and equips you for war. <laughs> and after a while, you ain't worried about the training anymore because you start getting a little pride and understanding, healthy pride in what you're representing and the uniform you wear and what you're fighting for. And all of a sudden, that overtakes all the work and effort it took to get suited up. <laughs> all of a sudden, you don't mind the sweat and the jogging anymore and the heat and the pressure and the drill sergeant drilling you. And <laughs> I mean, I'll smile all the way along, but... <laughs> But all of, a sudden you're, all of a sudden you stand up and you realize what you're wearing and what you're representing and you realize what all this was for. And all of a sudden it doesn't matter anymore because you're standing for something instead of falling for everything. Oh, that was a good analogy. That was holy. Is that on tape? No, it's good. I might preach that sometime. <laughs> did you have a, did your hand go up? Yeah. What you got? <laughs> oh, he's giving me his phone. <laughs> yeah. He's thinking this is going to get in me and I'm going to have to have one of these. I know. <laughs> Everybody says, you got to get a cell phone. I say, I don't even want a cell phone. I just a pastor freaked out when he heard I didn't have his, I was traveling. He said, you don't have a cell phone? I mean, he talked to me like I was a knucklehead. He said, you don't have a cell phone? And I said, no. And I said, and I don't have a computer. Either. What? <laughs> and I said, I said, and check this out. And I took his finger and I put it right here. Amen. I said, and I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, very alive and not distracted. And I'm not against cell phones. And everything, but I wonder who has the capacity to have all this technology and still be in a good place. Yeah. What am I reading? Because something turned and flipped on me and I'm lost. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know what I did. Oh. Let's see. That's just God confirming. <laughs> this is verse 10 that we just read. Through followers of Jesus like yourselves gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among the angels. Think about it. God has a predestined eternal purpose and plan for our lives, and that's why we're alive. You're not alive by happenstance, thank you. You're not alive just because two people came together. You're alive because God said so and has an eternal purpose and an eternal plan. Now, why would I try to live anything else and struggle with something less than what I'm here for where total grace is found? See, because everything else makes life an experiment or your own agenda and journey. Look, if I wasn't created for me and I was created for His image and I finally realized that through the Word of God, why don't I yield to that so I find a place of grace and favor to walk out that destiny rather than push against the bricks and fight to have my own way when I wasn't even... That's separating me from the very one that put me here with purpose. That would be like you driving your car and it was made for you to drive and you get in it and try to go right and it turns left. And you're trying to get to Harvest Chapel and it's taking you back some road and you can't steer it. That'd be like the car having a mind of it. And it's created for you to drive. And until it takes you to where you need to go, it hasn't fulfilled its purpose. And if it's taking you somewhere else, it's obstinate and it's outside of its creative value. And it would have no value to you and you wouldn't get in it anymore. Man, these are good analogies. <laughs> See, you have to realize you have a created purpose. And the Bible makes it real clear. Watch. According to the eternal purpose which, oh, which he accomplished. So you're not under the pressure of fulfilling this, just yielding to it and going with the river of God, going with the flow of the river. Right? We love those terms. 
So let's do it. Let's get in the river. Let's go with the flow of grace. Watch. Uh, He accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. So Christ Jesus brought us back. He got us up out of the fall. He redeemed us. He put us right back on track. And every man must be born again. again. Isn't this clear? Come on. In whom we have, what do we have? Oh, I'm getting excited. Pick up my Bible. I'm going to pace a little. Not too much, Randy. I've been doing good to you. I've been doing real good. In whom we... I've been thinking, Randy. I haven't even crossed this line. Did you notice? I have not crossed this line since that day. That's amazing. That's the Spirit of God. Yeah, I've I've tried many times. And it's like that dog that has that shock thought to him. (gasps) You ever have them dogs? They wear them things and after a while they take them off because they learn to not go past that spot. And he looks like he's running to kill you and he gets right to that spot. (laughs) And he won't move. Well, I've been like... (laughs) I just can't. There's something about that spot. It's God's love for Randy. (laughs) Okay, let's get back here. (laughs) Okay, look, in whom we have what? Boldness. Boldness. Oh my goodness. Because we see this is true in God's love and mercy to come and redeem us and restore our eternal purpose and value and not just throw us away, not just call us throwaways. Well, I made you to live for me. You're not living for me, so... That's not God. He woos and draws and, 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 and it, oh my goodness, it speaks to our heart. There's times you get your life in a, who, who's ever had their life in a messed up place and you knew it and you knew you should care more, etc. And you're laying on your bed quiet and these thoughts come to you and they're soft, they're, 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 they're wooing and they're like, man, you know it doesn't have to be this way. Just sweet, just thoughts, just, just countering thoughts that say, man, you know, you don't have to, be, it doesn't have to be this way. Boy, that sure beats God just hovering over your bed and pinning you to it because he's God, you know. So, you want to live for yourself. You know, come on. You'd be like, no, no. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then he'd disappear and you'd wake up in the morning and you'd be a Christian robot living out of the fear, afraid fear. Instead, the goodness of God and the love relationship. See, that's what's so amazing about God. Come on. God would have the ability to sit on the throne and go, bzz, bow to me, bzz, sing loud, bzz, worship, bzz, follow me. Instead, he humbled himself, came in the likeness of flesh and died on the cross, died for his man, so that man would get the picture and see and fall in love. (sighs) That's all that's wrong with me. That's finally happened. It took 33 years. Took 33 years, but it happened. Yay. Ugh. So I have boldness. What do I have? Why? Because I see his heart. I know who he is. I realize he came to rescue me. He loves me. He's not mad at me. He has purpose for me. Ugh. So I have boldness. Why? Because his heart's revealed. I'm not afraid of him. I'm not afraid to approach him. I have boldness and I have access. <laughs> see, this is where faith comes in. You either have access or you don't, right? Yep. Come on. Because if you believe you have access, why aren't we accessing? Mm-hmm. Boldness and access, oh my goodness, with confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Do I seem confident? No. <laughs> See, confidence and pride are two different things. Don't think that confidence has anything to do with pride. Com- you're supposed to have confidence. You're supposed to not throw away your confidence. Boldly, confident, has nothing to do with presumption and pride. He's the one that put the confidence in me. He's the one that put the boldness in me by revealing his heart. You get it? So I have access with confidence, uh uh-oh, through faith in him. Yeah, but brother. See, stop right there. There's no yell but brother. (laughs) The truth is the truth. It is what it is. It's here. You, You step into it and say, thank you. Thank you, I have amazing purpose. Watch, even if you have to start here. Father, I thank you, I have amazing purpose in my life. And even though I don't see totally clear like I believe I could, you created me with reason. 
Would you reveal why I'm on this earth? Would you make it really clear what it means to have Christ in me? Would you begin to father me and show me the intent of your heart in designing and fashioning me before the foundation of the world? Before you ever fashioned the worlds, you shaped me in your heart. You shaped me in your mind. You shaped me in your vision. Would you reveal the beauty of that legacy? Would you reveal that destiny to my heart? Just starting right there saying I'm ready to run God would bring great favor and grace to your life. You see, I don't know how many of us have been taught, let alone even thought, to pray those ways. It's so good. That's what faith does. Faith seeks Him. What's it mean to seek Him? See, we've been conditioned to just pray about trouble. We've been so conditioned to let this gospel be so self-focused and self-centered instead of knowing Him and loving Him and becoming like Him. And that's why there's a lot of people discouraged, backslidden, distracted, and not all excited about the good tidings of great joy. Do you get it? Yeah. Trish, wait, BJ's coming. Got to mic you up. Yeah. <laughs> so that your voice can be heard. <laughs> Go ahead. We good? Go ahead. Sorry. Um, the difference between the pride and the confidence. And well, there's a big really difference between like pride and confidence. Confidence comes from knowing him in his heart. Pride is presumption. Just presumption. What gives me boldness to go into the throne room of mercy and grace? Boldness and confidence are, are really hand in hand. What gives me boldness to go into the throne room of grace? In his court, because I see Jesus, the high priest, sitting there representing me. He came to die for me, to redeem me, to restore me back to the Father. He didn't come to take me to heaven. He came to get me back to the Father. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. What's he the way? He's the way back to the Father. Right? So, so I have confidence to approach him now because he came to me while I was lost. Presumption is disregarding all that and pride is just disregarding all that and just, just assuming, presuming, hey, well, I'm right with God. Well, hey, God understands. Hey, God knows my heart. No, I pray to God. I know a lady, she was, uh, she was, uh, oh, God, okay. She was willfully doing things that she knew were edifying, helping her life and yet embracing a language as if she had this intimacy with God. And while she was doing those things, she would outwardly talk to the Lord as if she was in fellowship with Him. And there was a presumption that began to grow in her heart and then her life went completely into the darkness. Because she taught herself and, and started to get in denial. And I, I, I believe me, if I was involved in her life, we addressed these things. And I said, honey, that's, that's delusion. What do you mean? But he loves me. But he loves me. I said, honey. I'm talking and she ended up adultery, darkness, believe me. Because it's presumption. It was probably it was assuming to have access with him, taking this message and, and, and giving it a, mushing it. Mushing it instead of allowing it to build integrity in her, it was giving her permission and occasion for the flesh, which Paul says immediately when he talks about not being under the law but under grace. He immediately says, So do we continue to sin so grace is flowing everywhere? No. Because you're not created for sin. You're not created, you've created for God's pleasure. You're not created for flesh pleasure. You're not created for less than Him. You get it? So, and, and that's what I want to get on right now. But, but that's the difference. There's a pride. There's a pride and a presumption. And then there's a true repentance. There's a repentance that takes account for your life and responsibility for your actions without getting condemned and says, Oh God, and comes into him receiving his love, receiving change. You see what I'm saying? Versus, hey, whatever, God loves me. Hey, he knows my heart. I can't tell you the young people I've counseled over the years that get that impression. And I get on this all the time. It's not because all these young folks are here, I promise. I don't project on people. 
But they, they and I, for some reason, I just feel like I need to qualify that, and that's not because of insecurity. I know my own heart. I just, for your sakes. But they, 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 they're sleeping together and saying, well, look, let's just do this, and then God will forgive us anyway. He's a loving God. And then they sleep together and forgive us, God. Sleep together, forgive us, God. And that's what they do. And then when you counsel them, you say, well, God loves us. He preached forgiveness. He says, we just can't help it. We love each other, and we're going to get married soon, and God still forgives us. We just we do that and say, God, please forgive us. <laughs> There's no way your conscience can get clear. You're, that's willful. That's just you fulfilling your desire and not gaining understanding of why this is not just a law. This isn't just a law. There's a good benefit in the whole abstinence thing. There's a beauty to it that needs explained. Well, of course, if I'm involved with these folks' lives, I've already explained that. <laughs> But yet, well, yeah, but we can't help it. God's not going to judge us for something we can't help. So when we do this, we both look at each other and say, you know, we shouldn't do this. Yeah, I know, but God will still forgive us. So they do it. Forgive me. Forgive me. Forgive me. You will stalemate your spiritual growth, muddy your soul, and get yourself in delusion and presumptuously be approaching him and won't even know him if you continue in that. God can't, can't, God can't be in the midst of that because he's empowering something. He's enabling something. You follow me? And that's why some people are afraid to preach what I'm preaching because of people taking the message with a willful heart and trying to misread it and make it say what they need it to say to cover face. I'm not afraid to preach it because if anybody's hearing with a hearing ear, this message changes your life. It doesn't empower your sin. It changes your life. I'm telling you, it's hard to keep track of folks, not just young people. All ages, this scenario. All ages. In fact, I was, I was in a service and I had four or five, I don't know what was going on, I had four or five ladies in their 50s come up to me crying that had been through divorce and had, had not been with a... Uh, a husband for whatever reason whether he passed or divorced and they all had STDs and they're in their 50s and they just got the STDs so we think it's just young people no it's people with insecurity in that there's people that need to be with someone to fill a void that only Christ can fulfill which I'm trying to read here but that one lady came to me and said because it was four or five of them I don't know what was going on I was like whoa but this one lady, she was one of the first ones, she felt a need to tell me her story because she felt so. But here's what she did. She grabbed me and pulled me close and she cried and said, I have an incurable STD. And I said, really? She said, yeah. I said, okay, honey, we'll just go pray. I don't need to know the story. I don't care. But she, it, can't, it mattered to her. Here's what she said. It was a form of confession. Confess your faults one to another. Pray for one another that you might be. So it was totally cool. She said... She leaned in and she whispered, oh, it broke my heart. I said, I could cry for her right now just because of what she went through. I'm happy for her because she got totally healed. I went back six weeks later and she's lit up like a light bulb, completely healed of an incurable STD. And uh, she was so pumped and I was pumped too. But she leaned in and she said, I recently went through a terrible divorce. I was so hurting. She said, I didn't realize how hurting I was. I'm really not that kind of girl. I'm really not that kind of girl. What she meant is she ran and grabbed somebody to comfort her. And she had been with her husband her whole marriage. And now here she is 52, divorced and alone and hurt. And she allowed somebody to comfort her. To no avail, no comfort there. <laughs> Just a brief moment in the flesh. <laughs> and as soon as the moment passes, you're going, oh my God, that was a zero. Serious. Because it can't fulfill your spirit. And your heart breaks. Well, what do you do? Curl up and die and get condemned? No. Go, God, what was I thinking? That was so, so flesh. That was so, wow. So you learn from it. Wow. There's vulnerabilities. There's hurt. Oh, God, only you can meet the need of mine. Only you can fulfill. Only you can satisfy mine. And instead of run from God and curl up and get condemned and feel like a whatever the world would call you now, you rise up and declare freedom. And let him come and father you and love you and embrace you and nurture you and restore you. Yes. You get it? 
So she leaned into me and said, I'm really not the kind of girl. And I knew what she meant. I said, honey, stop. It's, I was ready to ball for her and just hold her close like a brother. But I grabbed her and I prayed. It was so easy to pray for her. I said, you STD, you come out of her now. And she just prayed. And this is not the woman that was with any man. This is the woman that's with Jesus. And your heart is before the Lord and Father. And we prayed. I go back six weeks later and she comes up to me. Hi. I said, hey, honey, come here and hug her. She whispered to me, I've got totally tested. There's no trace of that thing in my body. It is gone. I am completely healed. I said, yeah, I believe you. Isn't that sweet? Yeah. yeah. Why? Because if she's sorry... And her heart breaks and she goes, oh, and doesn't get curled up in condemnation and shame, but goes, oh, and tells me, what she's saying is, that is not who I am. Yeah. That was deception. That was a moment of hurt, feeling sorry for myself. I got snared and captured. It is not who I am. That's what she's doing by talking to me. That's the statement she's making. So if that's not who she is, then how can the fruit of who that was still remain in her if that's not her? Do you get it? So by, Because this thing is spiritual and it's legalistic. Devils are very legalistic. Oh, okay. Backslid and falling. Oh, fornication. Zoop sticks to that stuff like Velcro and now it's there because it has the right to be there because you opened the door isn't that the language in the church and people say well I deserve this I opened the door well then close the door <laughs> don't get spiritual well I opened the door brother close it <laughs> are you okay I'm not being mean right now I'm, being, I'm trying to startle you into a belief system here <laughs> what are you, because that sounds so well brother you know I'm just reaping what I've sown plow the ground and get some new seed in there let's get a harvest pull out the weeds come on what do you mean repent Change the way you think and you're no longer that person and the spirit of God's goodness and grace through Christ comes upon you and makes all things new. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm better now, maybe. <laughs> That's a good revelation, that the redemption one. Because there's, Do you know how many people struggle with guilt, condemnation, shame because of the things they've done? And they don't understand the fact that they have guilt, condemnation, and shame is Satan's plan on the fact that their heart is really pure and they do care. Yes. Because if you didn't care, you'd have no capacity for guilt, condemnation, or shame. Yeah. You'd be cold, callous, and whatever. Amen. So the guilt, condemnation, and shame reveals you do care. And Satan, like a snake in the grass, is trying to tie you to your care and make you condemned instead of redeemed. Amen. What a rat. I think we ought to listen to Jesus instead of him. Amen. I bet you Jesus is right. Oh. <laughs> Good preaching, man. Did you see that? I don't know if that was Pentecostal. I don't know what that was. What was that? <laughs> Watch this. Watch this. That we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. Therefore, I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations. So don't even let what I'm going through distract you from this truth. Don't let adversity, don't let trials sideline you and pick back up yourself in your own life. That's what he's saying. Right on the heels of this. If this is your destiny, if this is your calling, don't let what I'm going through in life take you off of that truth. That's powerful the way God writes. That is because that's what we do, isn't it? We get this joy for a moment. Wow, that is so good. I'm going to walk this out. And then wham, 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 adversity comes. And we go, oh my God, but if, if you love me and if you have a plan, then how come and why? And oh my God. Right? Paul said, don't you ever lose heart. You glory in your tribulation. Why? Because you have the ability to persevere and character build and manifest Jesus. Adversity is the great privilege of revealing the Son of God in you. <laughs> See, that's the stuff we haven't gotten because we haven't heard a gospel that tells us to die to live. We've just incorporated him in for blessing. So adversity doesn't sound like blessing. 
But Paul says we glory in our tribulation because it's the privileged opportunity to manifest the Christ in you. (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) So you probably ought to have great joy because the tidings are good. Did you get it? You guys are getting it. (laughs) Don't try to smile like me. Your cheeks will hurt. (laughs) You have to grow into that. (laughs) I'm kidding. (laughs) I'm kidding. You can smile like me if you want to all day long. (laughs) I don't know what to do. John, I'm undone. (laughs) Here we go. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Watch at my tribulations, which is your glory. Like through the tribulations, there's even a greater manifestation of the things he's writing. He's able to prove through integrity and character and standing that he's the real deal. And what you see is what you get. It's the privilege place of manifesting when there's trials. Now watch for this reason. Here's the reason he prays this prayer that people put on the refrigerators. You have to realize why he prayed for this reason. I bow my knees to the father. For what reason? For this reason, the fact that the intent that God's wisdom's revealed to the powers of the earth through our lives. For this reason, I bow my knees and pray that you be perfected and formed in love. So what's the manifold wisdom of God revealed through your life? When you and I become like him and become love and take on his nature and manifest his heart through the earth. See where I get the message I preach? It's all through the Bible. It's in Colossians, it's in Ephesians, it's everywhere. But here's what I want you to see down at the bottom. At verse 19. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. To know, to know. It's probably epinosis, I don't know. It might not be. To know. I could find out, John 8, 34. I got an anointed Bible. I don't have an iPhone, I'd be there by now, but I have an anointed Bible. (laughs) Genosco, to know. What's how you say it? Gnosis, Jesus. Yeah. Hinosis. Hinosco. That's how it sounds. To perceive, to understand, to recognize, to realize. You know, like that. <gasps> to realize. Okay? To personally experience. It's the recognition of truth by personal experience. Pretty much the same word as epinosis. Experiential understanding. To know, to experience, to experientially recognize and know the love of Christ. Now watch this. Scripturally, there's no way to have it. If you're just waiting for God to drop that on your lap, to just zap you with that and call that a gift, you're going to be deceived. How's that for a strong statement? You receive His love. You believe His love and know His love. You get it? Unhindered, without a question. So to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. So in, in this prayer, he's praying that Christ dwell in your hearts through faith. That you be, see, he doesn't, he doesn't skip around faith here. He's not talking about a mystical zzz manifestation from God. That you be rooted and grounded in love through faith. Do you see that in verse 17? And that you be able to comprehend. In other words, that things be removed from your eyes and your mind that would stumble, trap, deceive, limit, regulate. That God would make clean the path of your understanding so you could perceive and comprehend this thing. Get you out of the way so he can go, ta-da! Right? So you could comprehend with all the saints... The magnitude of God's love. To know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. I don't even know what that means. I don't. But I know it's incredible. I know what fullness means. Fullness means a house with no empty rooms. That's what the word fullness means. You know what else it means? A town with no empty houses. Who? I know that when there's fullness in me, that every motivation comes out of that fullness. Every action and desire comes out of that fullness. 
When there's not fullness in me, every desire, every action comes out of the deficit, the drive, the emptiness, the need. And that's why we do a lot of what we do, because we haven't been established in love. How's that for straight up? Because to know His love is to be filled with fullness. So to not know His love is to have deficit. And that's what drives us. Need. Emptiness. Insecurity. A lack of esteem and identity. Trying to find ourselves through life and through one another. Support systems. (laughs) But to know the love of Christ. Filled. Fullness. No empty room. So then when I say, I love you, Anthony and Jenny, I can say it from the place of truth where there's not a single string attached nor an expectation and it's completely for their sake. Now that's the position we ought to all put one another in, isn't it? Oh, Jesse. Um... So that, would that be part, I mean, I think I know the answer to this question, but I just wanted to just confirm it. Like in your confession in the secret place with the Lord, we're thanking Him for filling us with His fullness right now. Even though excellent. we don't feel like we have. Even if you're not sure we, you have it. That's yeah. excellent, yeah. excellent. Let me give an example of that. Let me act that out because he, he had his question and answer all wrapped in one and he knew he had that. And, and we're going to really cover a lot of details with communing with God. And this is good because this is the Spirit of God to incorporate communing with God with this precept right here. So I'm in, a, I'm in a car driving. I don't have to be a... I, I always say in a bedroom just because that's where I've spent so much time. Okay, so I know that you don't have to be in a bedroom. And you don't have to make an appointment with God. Don't make appointments with God. You're in fellowship with God. But there's times where nobody's looking. You break away or you're laying in bed and nobody's around. If you're married, your spouse isn't even there. Or they're at work or the, the kids are somewhere else. And you're just there at home. And it's one of those moments where... And you just capture that moment. I had a friend that was, didn't go to work for a whole year. He had finances saved and he left his job and thought, I'm just going to hang out and seek God and just take a year and just whatever. And at the end of the year, he came to me and cried and said, I realized a whole year flew by and I never really got intimate with the Lord. He said, my time just got occupied and I just lived life. You know how quick that happens and how it's happening to people? And it's easy to say we're hungry, but our life reveals our hunger. Because <laughs> if I really want him, I'm going to seek him, not say I want him. <laughs> it's just true. That's not too heavy to say. It's just getting real with your own heart. You see what I mean? So I spent countless time doing this. So I loved your, your comment because it's right on the money. And this is what Holy Spirit led me in when I first got saved. And, and honestly, he led me there. I... And, and some people say, well, see, that was sovereign. I believe, and I know we're saved by grace, I believe the night that I got saved, I, I, I got out of denial. God moved on my heart. Of course He did. It's grace that saves us. But there was a total surrender that night. I gave myself to Him. Some people find themselves going along the way, giving more and more as they go. Now, I suggest that you get alone and just purpose to give yourself to Him. Even if, you, even if you're not sure what that means, then get alone with God and just, I give myself to you. And if any way I'm reserving rights or holding things to myself, Holy Spirit, you're my friend. You show me this because I will let it go. That way you're not nitpicking, searching, introspecting with negative resumes. You're just seeking God. And along the way, things get stripped and cleaned out. Do you get it? And you're not always fishing and looking back. Does this make sense? Because I have a greater faith in his ability to keep me than me be misled. Because I know without him keeping me, I'm I'm already toast. I've learned that. If he didn't come and father me at times and show me things, I was in the dark. But because of this faith before him in this relationship, and even asking the Holy Spirit, look, I know you love me. I don't care what what discipline means. If you have to kick me in the butt, whatever that means, keep me in you. I've talked that way to the Lord. And he probably chuckles because I'm just saying, and, and, and there's times where he'll, oh, and you save me, rescue me. I'm ready to, I'm thinking this way and I'm ready to go. And he says, what are you doing? Oh. You get what I'm saying? 
There was a time I was driving, I tell this story a lot because it was just it was one of the first times he ever really, it was almost like a, a good friend when they, when they nail you and you're like, oh man, I didn't even cry or nothing. I laughed like, oh, I was like, oh, like you got me, you stuck me. Because I was driving and my mind was quiet and it was negative. It was going in a negative tone and I drove about a mile. And see, some people say, well, I do that all the time. Now, I don't, I don't, but I did that day. And I don't want to. And my face been for the Lord. And I don't try to. But I did that day and fell right into it and didn't even realize. I'm just going right with the flow of negativity. I'm looking at something and how it looks. And it ain't going the way that I anticipated. And I'm getting a little like, and the longer I drove and the more I thought that way, the bigger and worse it got. And I went about a whole mile down the road, which doesn't sound long and sounds funny to people. Because some people spend days, weeks, months, and years in that mindset. And I thank God, I'm not, that, that is not the mindset of edification, I promise you. So I'm driving and I got to a four-way stop sign. I can remember the road I was on, it was Canal Road, uh, or uh, uh, Church Road out extended. And I got to the four-way stop sign and Holy Spirit said, Boy, Dan, now would be a good time to practice all that stuff you preach. <laughs> I was like, whoa! <laughs> Slam me! I was laughing so hard I could hardly drive because it just made me laugh. He's a friend, but he said it in such a way. He said, "Boy, Dan, that'll be a good time to practice all that stuff you preach." I went, <laughs> and snapped me right out of that. And I went, "Whoa!" And guess what? My response was, I started to see it through Christ and faith, and and I countered all that and just washed all that negative away and just crushed it with faith before the throne. Why? Because He came and fathered me and rescued me. Why? Because I want him to. I don't have reserved rights. I want him to. So I get alone. Father, I thank you. You're everything I'll ever need. You're the fullness of my life. You're the strength and the security. Father, I don't need the honor of men, approval and affirmation. If men encourage me, so be it. But I am not living for it. My life is in you. My strength is in you. Everything I ever am and will be is found in you. It's your grace that satisfies me. It's knowing you and knowing your love. Father, you've made me complete. You've made me strong. You've made me one. Come on, that's just prayer. I could take that right there, that one line. I could go and lose. I could forget you're here if I'm not careful and go for about a half hour and just have communion. And it would just get bigger. I think you could tell that by the way I have trouble preaching. <laughs> because I could just go and just forget you're here and just have, it would just, and I believe it. And I believe it. And it's not saying that it's my current reality right now, but I know it's true. I know he's all I need. All that I need is you, Lord Jesus. I've sang that song. All that I need is you, Jesus. All that I need is you. I've stood in my bedroom for so many hours singing songs like that. From early this morning till late tonight. All that I need is you. My Jesus, all that I need is you. You're everything to me. You've come and satisfied my heart. The hunger, the cry, I didn't even know what I was hungry for. But thanks that I was hungry. Now I know it was you. Thanks for satisfying my desire. I love you, Daddy. <gasps> Hours. What a friend I found. Hours. I can't even tell you. Sit on the bed. Repeat. Closer than a brother. <laughs> Hours. Hours. You have no idea. <laughs> See, it doesn't get monotonous. Man, can you hit another track? Are you kidding? I'm becoming that one. Leave it play. I'm not listening to that for entertainment to appease the distracted mind. I'm not reading my Bible to be a Christian, to feel Christian. I'm reading my Bible to know Him and become the Word. So let, let it play, just leave it play, because I'm becoming the truth on that song. Jesus. And you know how, that, that, there's, a, there's a recording on Jesus, what a friend I found, it's, it's, it's an older recording. I don't even know who does it, but I have it at home on a CD, and it, it really gets big, it just starts. And it just, and oh, Oh, see, I was just dumb. And you sit there and you just cry. Sometimes you laugh. Sometimes you just, ah! 
And sometimes you're just quiet and it's just sinking in. But you just go with the flow and you let the truth make you free. See, I think we're in a hurry, we're striving, we're struggling. Man, if I could just prophesy, I feel, boy, if I could just hear a word, if I could just, you know, if I could just know him, everything will be okay. So get alone. <laughs> and trust he's there. Don't get alone and sit there. <laughs> well, see, this doesn't work for me. See, faith, we've been teaching faith all along. Father, you absolutely love me. Thanks for being here. Thanks for filling my heart with all that you are and causing me to understand and see the depths and beauty of your love. Thank you for forming me in Christ. Holy Spirit, I appreciate the work you're doing in me. And I thank you, you're etching me, molding me, shaping me, and making me more like you. Thank you that every trial in life is helping perfect Christ in me. I'm not moved by adversity. I am moved by your love. Your hand is upon me. And I worship you and honor you and give my whole being to you. Thank you that when men look into my face, they see your light. When they look into my eyes, they know your love. Because, Father, you have made me one with you. I pray that stuff. I think that stuff. I talk that stuff. Can you tell I talk that stuff? Ah, so what's wrong with me <laughs> that sure beats God I wish you'd move and, and help so, and I wish you see because in relationship it changes a lot even though those things are important and they need covered you even pray you, we're going to get on all that too healthy intercession because we, we, we got a lot of time <laughs> but we're going to because See, you want to pray from a faith that works through love. You want to see in agreement with God. You want to address these situations and speak life over them, not just fret, complain, and try to positionally pray correct. Come on. How many things have we prayed, 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 and haven't seen change? Tons. And then the more that happens, the more you're aware of that and aware of what needs to change, and it drives you. That right there drives you. Not to Him, in another way. I'm telling you, you'd be amazed that you don't even see things the same. It's not denial, it's just seeing things through the light. Things don't move you, drive you, hurt you, scare you. When you're living this, you're looking from his seat. And your response is totally different than you in your own seat as a Christian trying to serve God. It's It's a whole different perspective. You're seeing from his view. He's just, oh, it's just, yeah, and that you'll have, you have to walk in to really understand. That's a hard one to teach out, but it's void of fear and worry and concern. You're not going to reduce prayer to a method and scripture to a principle. You get what I'm saying? You know how we've reduced scripture to a principle and a method that we proclaim to get a result? And, and it's so impersonal and it doesn't build relationship. If anything, it challenges relationship because your intellect then reserves the right to say, why didn't it work and where was God? Or introspective, what am I doing wrong? Why didn't God answer my prayer? And, it's, it, and all of that confronts closeness. Come on. Man, if to know His love is to be filled with all His fullness, I know where I'm camping. And I know where I'm staying. Because everything's going to flow from there. Even faith, guys, works through. You see why I'm taking so long on talking about righteousness and free from sin consciousness and all that stuff? Because faith works through. You're rooted and grounded in love. You're saying love. (laughs) (laughs) Hebrews 10. We're going to (laughs) try. Let me go through this quickly. And we'll try to get this in before the break so I can go to Romans 6 and try to wrap this thing up. If we don't, we don't, but I want to try to. I I feel like I really want to try to. He might let me just because of the love for my own soul because I'm starting to think, man, I'm taking too long to get through this. Okay, we went through this. We talked about the law having a shadow of good things to come. Not the very image of things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer year by year make those approach complete or perfect. For then they would, would they have not ceased to be offered? Of course they would. For the worshippers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sin. So what Paul's writing here, or whoever the writer is in Hebrews, 
because he seems to be unknown. But, so let's just say whoever wrote this, inspired by Holy Spirit, is saying, what's he saying? He's saying that the goal is to get free from the consciousness of sin and that this first way called through the law and sacrificing goats and bulls and, and giving of blood of animals, it, it wasn't the way or it would have been ceased to be offered. It would have been once for all which he's pointing to the blood of Christ, right? And he's, and, but the goal, and, which means the accomplishment of the blood of, blood of Christ is to make you complete and no more consciousness of sin. But in those sacrifices, there's a reminder of sin every year. See, that's not a good thing. For it is impossible or not possible that the blood, it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can take away sin. Why? Because it's man for man. It's blood for blood. It's, it's the blood of bulls and goats. There was an atonement. There seemed to be a sacrifice. These innocent, it's all pointing to good things to come. These innocent, did them bulls and goats have anything to do with man eating the tree? No. But they're dying because of man. Sounds like the son of God, the lamb. Did Jesus eat the tree? Did he have anything to do with sin? Was he responsible or completely innocent? And isn't it amazing he's the one that died? So these little lambs, these spotless lambs, they, man, they're just born. They have a little life to live. They want to have little lambs. But now they're getting their throats cut and the blood's being poured on the altar because man sinned. So there's a pointing, it's a pointing to Christ. It's one day someone, someone, a man, not an animal, completely innocent, is going to die the same way. And his blood is going to wash your sin away. And when John saw him along the shores of the Jordan, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of man. Come on, that's what your Bible says. <laughs> oh, now watch this. Now watch this. Therefore, when he came into the world, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. Wow. Why? Because he was made to be a man in flesh. Man was created for the image of God and have subdued the earth and have dominion and, and in the authority of God and by the grace of God, he was to govern the earth. What man failed, Jesus came and became a man and fulfilled. He was the last Adam. So he became the captain of our salvation, the perfect sacrifice. He was tempted at all points without sin. He walked through trials and testings, uh, rejection, adversity, temptations of devils. He went through the wilderness just like the children of Israel. They were in there 40 years. He was in there 40 days. He came out with the spirit and power. They died. Why? They were selfish. He was selfless. Big difference. 40 years and die. 40 days anointed spirit and power. Yes. Same wilderness, same atmosphere, same God, same devil. Different motive. Selfish. What about us? Be better for us. Complaining. Well, where's God? Well, if he's so good, why are we still out in this wretched rocky place? Well, if he wasn't so good, why is he putting food on the ground and covering you with fire and cloud? And growing up your clothes and keeping you. See, we miss that. And then all of a sudden, the gospel's not even enough. And they loathe the worthless bread that was sustaining them. It was a sign of life. Pointing to the bread that was to come from heaven. Pointing to Christ. He says in Corinthians 10, don't you do what they did. And don't you tempt Christ like they did in the wilderness. That means they loathe the worthless bread. It takes you to Numbers 21. And they said, this gospel, this bread, your provision isn't enough for my life. That's what they were saying. It's heavy, isn't it? Come on. Mentality. Protect yourself. Young and old alike. Protect yourself. Mentality. Perspective. So you come out of your tent door and you go, oh, same old stuff again. Here we go again. So you've got to guard your heart. You're the steward of your heart. Here we go again. You know, you think God could mix it up a little. He said we'd be in a land of milk and honey and we're still eating this grimy stuff. Manna means what is it? They didn't even know what it was. What is it? Well, it was keeping them alive and it was, it was a miracle. It was coming while they were sleeping at night and it was on the ground every morning guaranteed. And they were only allowed to take enough for today so that they could enjoy the glory and goodness and provision of God every day and keep their heart in tune. And not take for granted the blessing. But what did they do? 
All of a sudden, it's not good enough. And, and, and here's this bread. We don't even know what it is. Who cares what it is? It's from God, and it's keeping you alive. And it's a sign that when things look really bad, He is there, and He is your sustenance. He is the Lord. So there they are, coming out of their tent door, disdaining the bread. Loathing the bread, complaining against Moses and God. Verses coming out of your tent. Coming out of your tent going, Oh God, there you go again. You were so amazing. I got my three little babies in there. I can sleep every night in total peace knowing that in the middle of this nowhere place, you're here. And you're somebody that loves us. Never fear again. Doesn't matter where I'm at if you're here. It matters that you are who you are. And I appreciate your great provision for us, Father. We will never starve and never die and never be afraid. Because you're faithful. (laughs) That sure beats coming out of your tent going, Oh, same old dumb stuff again. Well, why aren't we in the promised land by now? Well, why do we have to sit out here and just eat this stupid stuff on the ground? Tired of eating stupid crummy stuff on the ground. See, that's what we do if we're not careful. Instead of catch what it really was all about. That when things look really bad and really tough, don't you miss the glory of who He is. When things don't seem to be panning out, oh, I can't. When things don't seem to be, I'm stuck, Randy, I can't. When when things don't (laughs) seem to be panning out, right? The way you were thinking. Don't lose sight of who he is right then. See, 40 days and died and wandered. 40 years, I mean. 40 years and wandered and died. 40 days anointed, spirit and power, fulfilled ministry. There's a lesson. Follow him. Amen? Amen. Jesus is amazing. So, so watch this. A body you prepared for me. Why? Because a man, a man, you have to understand he's still a man. He's not a spirit. He's a man. When he rose from the dead, he said to his disciples, when he rose from the dead, he walked through the wall as a man. Empowered by God. And he said, touch me. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bone as I. It is me. What's he trying to say? He wants us to know positionally, legally, theologically, he is still a man because he's about to ascend as a man, the man, Timothy, book of Timothy, the man. No man can mediate between God and man, but the man, capital M-A-N, Jesus Christ. He wants you to know he's still a man sitting on his own blood on the mercy seat at the right hand of the Father, mediating on behalf of mankind. A man is in the holy tabernacle, a high priest forever, able to save to the Hebrew 7, the uttermost, those who come to him by faith because he never dies or changes. (laughs) See where confidence comes from? So this either becomes doctrine or you give your life to this and you begin to pray and rejoice and seek understanding and Holy Spirit enlightens you and all of a sudden empowers your life through this truth and truth makes you free. Or it just becomes doctrine and you just go to Bible school and get a degree in Bible. I didn't say that derogatory. Anybody has a degree in Bible. What I'm saying is you don't need just knowledge. That'll puff you up. That'll take the place of your relationship with God. That's what'll make you spiritual. Your Bible knowledge, wrong. Your Bible knowledge won't save you. (laughs) Do you get it? Yes. It's love that edifies. Knowledge can puff you up, guys. A body you prepared for me, and burnt offering, sacrifice for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will. So it's the will of God for Jesus to come. It's the will of God for him to die on the cross. It's the will of God for him to redeem man. It's the will of God for him to conquer death. It's the will of God for him to remove sin. So everything Jesus did is the will of God. When you see me, you see the Father. I only do your will. 
Previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offering and offering for sin, you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which were offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He takes away, when he said this, he's taking away the first. That's chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. The thing that could never make us perfect or free from sin. He takes away the first, the giving of bulls and blood and goats. And he, and he may establish the what? The second, the New Testament, and the new will of God towards man. By that will, by that will, we have been set apart, called out of darkness into the light. Why? Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for every person, right? Now watch. And every priest is still standing ministering. Every priest stands ministering. People of the Jewish heritage, not slamming them. They, they still do, they, you don't know this maybe, they still do that to them little goats and stuff. Yeah. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never, which can never take away sins. So it's only the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can wash away my sin Nothing but the blood of See, it's not even you fretting enough <laughs> It's you believing enough If you fret, do it for about three seconds and That qualifies your heart <laughs> And then thank God you're clean do you get it? Boy, it makes it simple. He wants you at peace with him. It does do him no pleasure if you lay on a couch and cry all day because you blew it. You cry initially or you go, oh God, or you, there's a repentance. There's sometimes a deep godly sorrow, but it should be for a moment. Right? The Lord himself came to me and in worship, I told you this story before, and wrecked me in worship, I was undone. I went through a whole box of Kleenexes, it's no joke. I had Kleenexes piled up so high, it was ridiculous. A lady came in compassion and slid another one under my arm. If you didn't know what was going on, you'd have looked and thought maybe I was being exposed from some hidden sin, or I had crossed some line and broke my own heart or something. I was crying so hard. It was just God's goodness sweeping over me, and he was going, I love you. I really love you and I'm like <laughs> and I had to preach and I'm thinking I gotta preach God I gotta preach what are you doing and finally I realized he knows I have to preach <laughs> took me a while but I thought he knows I have to preach and he's still doing this to me so I thought I'm just gonna let him do it and I'm gonna be a wreck and who cares I mean, if God knows I have to preach and if I don't preach I don't preach so I just yielded to what he was doing and I was like well thanks for thinking I'm special and I just mushed and in that, he said, do you know why you live the way you do? Well, I know what he means by that, because I live with me. And I know that I'm not here to put on a show for you. I live with me. I know, I know me. And that's what he said to me. Do you know why you live the way you do? And I answered like you would have. I said, because of your amazing grace. He was talking about the consistency, the continued joy, the no condemnation, the no despair, the no depression and discouragement, just pumped and alive inside. And he said, he said, do you know why? And I said, I understand it's late. I know, we'll, we'll break. I said, because you're awesome and your grace is sufficient for me. Because your spirit's upon me, because you're amazing. God, thank you for what you do. And it was almost as if he chuckled. Like, eh, that wasn't the answer. I said, but, and I thought, that's blasphemy. Yeah, it's, you're great. I am what I am by the grace of God. You're conditioned that. It's like, that's, is this even the voice of God? You know? But, but I didn't actually, I was just having fun with that. I actually, I, I was so overwhelmed by the Spirit of God. I knew when he was talking to me, this was all God. But he, he was laughing. He said, no, Dan, that's not it at all. And I'm thinking, what do you mean that's not it at all? That has to be the reason. Well, who knows ultimately that is the reason, that it's God's grace. But there, you have to be in a position to receive that grace. Come on. It's like that, that, that jacket I bought for Hannah last week. If she didn't put it on, she's never going to enjoy the gift, right? Who knows that it's one thing to be positionally righteous. It's another thing to live that way and wear it. Here's what God said. He said, no, Dan. He said, it dates back to the night you got saved in the warehouse. He said, and on that night you got saved, you were sin conscious for a moment. 
And ever since that moment, you've been a son in your heart. And I curled back up and bawled and bawled and went through a bunch more Kleenexes. Because he's the one that allows me to be a son. But I'm the one that has to say, thank you, okay. That's what I'll be. Do you get it? So is it his grace that saves me? Yes. Am I am what I am by the grace of God? Absolutely. But if my perspective isn't in agreement with truth, I can't walk in the blessing of that truth. You follow me? I could let condemnation eat my lunch. I could let lies rob me. I could let other things mean more. You follow me? Okay. I'm going to have to jump on this after the break. Yeah, because we are at the major punchline. Let me just let me just do this quick. Let me take a minute. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly same sacrifices which can never what? Never. Verse 12. Oh, this is the good time to put in a butt when it's a butt, yeah, but in God. But this man. But this. See, you don't want the yell butts that count of God. When you're talking about the truth of God and say yell but, that's whacked. When you're talking about what can't work and then but. But God, you were lost, you were alienated, but God, who's rich in mercy, right? <laughs> this stand ministry, never take away sin, but this man. See, it's a good yell but. But this man, capital M-A-N, what is he? This man. He's calling him a man. Yep. He, he wants you to see he came as a man. But this man, after he had offered how many sacrifices? One. One. For sins forever. Ah! For s- sin or sins? Sins. Sins. Ah! Somebody better get good tidings of great joy through this because if not, I'm going to look funny because I'll be... Ah! <laughs> But this man, after he had offered one, how many? One One sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. And you can look into that and find that that's actual physical death. That's, That's death. Watch. For by one... Ah... By one offering, he has, past tense, get this guys, pay attention, he has perfected oh, forever. Huh. Those who are being sanctified. That means those who want born again called out of darkness set apart I want to be a child of God well then that's what matters you want I don't want to live for myself then you qualify I don't want to sin then you qualify come on in I've paid the price to forever make you complete in my sight now come and be a son and run well come on is this in your Bible or this in just in my notes oh this might be ridiculous in the message Bible it was a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people. By that single offering, he did everything that needed to be done for everyone who takes part in this purifying process. It's finished. It is finished. Oh, so he perfected forever those who believe is really what it's saying. So what are you right now? Perfect. And where is sin? holy, blameless, above reproach. Is this in the Bible? Why aren't we like teaching this emphatically, passionately our whole lives and believing it and being the living product of this truth? (laughs) Take a break. (laughs) Oh, we just might go to Romans 6. It'll get scary. (laughs) I'm thinking. (laughs) They coming? Thanks, Susan. Jesus, you're amazing. Wow. 
Father, we thank you. Holy. Ooh, I would take one of that. You're very sensitive, though. Because I was just here thinking. That, really thinking that very thought. That, no, I'm good water-wise. It just felt a little. Thank you. Thank you for redeemed breath. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> you guys ready? Ready. Okay. Now I got excited about that punchline in Hebrews 10, but it's not even over yet. But because it goes down through, and if you keep reading, and even Martha and I were talking yesterday, Hebrews 9, going into 10. This gospel is the answer of a good conscience, a clear conscience. So it's the saving of your soul. It's the healing of your conscience towards God. Because we've all lived apart from Him. We've all lived with other desires. We've all lived with contrary things. So the gospel is the answer and the redemption of our conscience. It's really cool. And uh, so we actually can approach Him with an unveiled face. Yes. <laughs> because He forgave, what? Sins forever. He, he, he wiped them out forever. You saw that, right? Now, I want to read here. But the Holy Spirit, verse 15, also witnesses to us after he had said before, this is the covenant I'll make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. And then he adds, their sins and lawless deeds I will remember no more. That's amazing. Man. And we need to just believe that. Now, where there is remission, Right? Where there is remission or forgiveness, removal of sins, there is no longer an offering for sin. Okay? That's just amazing. Therefore, (laughs) see we don't have to back up, we've already been there. Therefore, because this is all true, brethren, having boldness to enter. See, this, the whole purpose of him writing all this is so you have boldness to enter that holy place by faith through the blood of Jesus and know that you're a child, made to be a child. Now look, it's by a new and living way. It's not an old and dead way. It's not a through the sacrifice of your little kitty or your puppy or the neighbor's whatever that you might want to sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get that for the atonement of my sins. I'm going back to the law. <laughs> no, no, no. That's no. This is a new and living way. I mean, if you're going to do it, don't do a puppy. Do a cat. If you're going to do it, at least do a cat. <laughs> I said that with the camera running. I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> I used to preach the cats came after the fall. I said, if you just look at their eyes, they go the wrong way and there's just something not right. And people are like, ah, I used to like you. And all of a sudden, cats had me crucified. <laughs> Serious, don't, don't pick a dog, pick a cat. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Well, no, I'm not. I'm actually not. <laughs> okay, first, I listen. I'm like, ah! Listen to the reaction. Okay, would you guys get free, okay? (laughs) You're going to lose your sanctity over a cat comment. Come on, let's go. (laughs) Okay, verse, yeah, Anthony's in agreement. He's like, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. (laughs) Verse 19. I tease my granddaughter, actually. She's only five and a half, and she has two cats, and I'm like, you don't need two cats. I said, you got this little place you're living in. You got too many cats. I said, why don't you give me that one cat? I said, I'll find a busy road and take your cat. And she says, Grandpa. She said, no busy road. And it's a, it's a joke we have. And uh, so we'll go by. And the old, who's ever seen a groundhog tried to cross the road? He's like, yeah. said, Grandpa, he found a busy road. <laughs> so, so it's just a joke. And she said to some of her, her family members, she said, my grandpa wants to take my kitty and find a busy road. She said, <laughs> It's just something I have fun with. I would not do that, okay? It's it's just a joke. (laughs) Brethren, having boldness to enter the holiness, the holiest. What are we doing? We have boldness to enter the holiest by what? By the blood of Jesus. See where humility comes from? He opened the door. He paved the way. He made it possible. Now watch. This is simple. This isn't deep. If he went to that extreme, he must want you there. Come on, that's almost like, I'm not being rude, that's almost a duh. 
thought right there. Right? Come on. If he went to this extreme and shed his blood to open the door, he must want you to come for him. You know, Jesse was just showing me on the break a couple of scriptures about that, 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 that we might become the righteousness, etc., etc. He said, man, I feel like that's not a strong enough word for me. I said, well, it, it is. What it's doing is it's, it's, it's exposing faith. In other words, the door's open that you might come through. The way home is made available that you might come home. So it's a thing of the heart. He's made the way possible for you to be free, that you might be made free. You have to receive the freedom. True? True? So, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, look, a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Oh, is that incredible or what? Ugh. And having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our conscience sprinkled from an evil or having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water sounds like we've been made clean so see this whole thing is the answer of a good conscience so therefore because this is true have boldness and enter into the holy place of God's presence seek him come boldly into his throne room don't visit there live there it's relationship don't try God don't take a, a method a, 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 a ology mindset and try to pursue God to know him and say this isn't working for me no you start by faith you live by faith the way I first entered in is the way I walk in him remember Second, uh, Colossians 2 now watch a new and living way who consecrated it he did it through the veil that is his flesh. He made it possible. One man died so all can live. Having a high priest over the house of God. So we have one that's representing us on behalf of God. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. At the same time, he represented God what? To us. And us to, that's, to God. That's what makes him a mediator. Do you get it? Yeah. Huh. So he came and represented God to us and the heart of God toward us. And in our response through his sacrifice, he takes and represents us back to God. He's a high priest forever. Okay? So because this is true, let us draw near with a true, sincere, a true heart, full assurance of faith. See how faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word? I know it works through love, but it's the word that makes it all known, right? That's why it says that. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast. Listen to the intensity of this language. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without waver. Right? Because why? He who promised is faithful. If he said, I love you, then what? He loves you. If he said he made the way, then he what? If he said it is finished, then it's what? It's so you can take him at his word. Yes. So don't you waver. Remember, holy, blameless, and above reproach. Remember? If indeed you continue steadfast in the faith and are not moved away from the hope in which you heard. Do you hear the passion of that language? Do you hear that it sounds like it might be a challenge and a battle and Satan might try to confront you and deceive you and distract you and try to get you condemned, guilty, and ashamed now that you're clean, free, and pure? Yes. Yes. Might try to get you to, to get into an action, a mindset that begins to rob your identity and now you act on a mindset and go, oh my God, and then say to see, you're not saved, you're not pure, see, you're still, see, you'll never be free. See what happens? Get you to be into wrong believing through wrong thinking and then wrong speaking or acting and then condemnation. Man, even if, it says even and if you sin and if you sin, not when you sin, if you sin. Oh, I love that. See, I pick that stuff up in my Bible when I read it. Oh, I'm not sin waiting to happen. I'm a son. Already happened. Do you get it? <laughs> But if I sin, 
See, it's not a permission slip. It's a catch net. It's a safety thing. It's God saying, and if you sin, don't throw away your identity and who you are because know you have an advocate, Jesus the righteous, and his mercy before me on your behalf will keep you clean and not just for you, but the whole world this provision's made. That's 1 John 2, verse 1. Not when you sin, if you sin. Why? Because he doesn't want me thinking sin. Romans 6. Yeah, it only took us almost two weeks, huh? What's today, though? Today's Wednesday? Oh, tomorrow's the last day of this week's school. Wow. (laughs) Romans 6. Look at verse 19 of Romans 5. Back up just a little so you catch what he's saying. I do that on purpose all the time because you want to read things in context. It's actually one big letter. That's what we forget. We read it like chapters. It's just one big letter. There's people defining Romans 7 and they're not even considering Romans 6 and 8. You couldn't define Romans 7 like I hear people define it if they read 6 and (laughs) 8. Especially if you just tack on 5. You might as well tack on 5. In fact, back up to 4. Just start in the beginning. Just read it. And then you'll know. But you can't interpret 7 wrong if you read 5, 6, and 8. True? So, and I don't know how far we'll get with this, but I I know we're going to see some stuff here because we got about 45 solid minutes to just nail this. You guys all right? Yeah. Okay. See, I want want you so free in this regard so that you can... Did you hear that language that was in Hebrews 10? That you can have boldness to enter the holiest, full assurance, confidence that you're His and He loves you and He paid the price necessary to qualify you because He sees the best in you and the potential for you. And even if you're not feeling all that and believing all that, you can believe that He sees that and you can go pursue Him so He can reveal that to you in the process. You say, well, I ain't just getting this, brother. The lights ain't coming on. Well, it's about going to Him. He's the light. In your light, I see light. You get it? Oh, come on. There's just no, just don't talk yourself out of Him. It's the flesh if that's happening. Oh, she's ready. She's Mike. <laughs> Trish is going, no. Martha's Mike. <laughs> uh, okay. All right. Hebrews 10 says, where there is remission of sin, there's no more offering for sin. So that means that remission means, we. I tend to think of terms of, all right, past sins and present sins. Um, so remission means a total remission. And if we're perfected, it actually means, means forgiveness. past, present, and it, well, actually, remission in, in the Greek are two completely different words. Remission is ephesus and, and forgiveness. Right, but in verse 18, you can put the word forgiveness there and do total justice to the word remission. Okay, well, what I'm sa- what the point I'm asking here for remission, past, present, and future sins. So, so that means everything... It's not just from here to the past. It's like because it's everything. God's not going to move you in life until you get this sin under the blood. What we so, just quote in First John two, not and when you sin, but if you sin, don't fall apart, throw away your identity. Just know you have an advocate, Jesus Christ. You see that ought to cause you to love Him all the more. If you find yourself, here's the key, Martha, to what you're saying. It says about the remission of sin there, and then in verse 19 it says, so having uh, boldness to enter the holy place, etc. And then in verse 22 it says, so let, here's the key, so let us draw near with a true heart. Yeah, you but- becoming true and sincere in your heart motive of life, and you're, you're not waking up finding a reason to sin and get away with it. You're not waking up pondering, meditating, willfully sinning. You're waking up with a heart to know God more, to walk in sonship, and along the way, you bump into the weakness of flesh. Man, that's just a growing thing. Father, I thank you this isn't who you created me to be. I thank you, Father, that I see in the light of who you are. I am called to a higher calling, and thank you for perfecting me, loving me, maturing me, and giving me wisdom. I am so excited because I wouldn't have saw that a year ago. I wouldn't have saw that two months ago. You are growing me up in you. Thanks for loving me. You can talk that way and be excited and grow and increase in the midst of an expression of human weakness. Rather than, oh my God, I can't believe I just did that. And I say I'm sincere and true. I can't be sincere. I wouldn't even have sin in my life. Why do I have sin? really love you, man. <laughs> if. 
<laughs> I love you, period. I love you, period. But if you could fix that, I'll appreciate it. Okay. So, yeah. So, here's the deal. That's why we covered this forgiveness thing. We're not, oh, please forgive me. Oh, 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 forgive me, God. Forgive me, forgive me. Don't do that. When are you even sure you're forgiven? The more you forgive me, forgive me, about the fifth time in, you are so aware of your sin, you are so sin conscious, you are so far from God. Come on, it's the truth. As soon as your heart goes godly sorrow, oh, that's enough. Now there's a time you might weep for 10, 15 minutes and really cry because it's sticking in you that this is so not God. But please not forgive me, God. Forgive me, God. Where is that? God, I so thank you. That is not who I am. That is not my desire. My heart is broken right now because I realize through the truth of your word that is not who I'm created to be. And God, I thank you for washing me and cleansing me and making me wiser and sharper. And God, thank you. Right? Okay. Second Corinthians 7, real quick, real quick, real quick. I know that's not Romans 6. Okay, Second Corinthians 7. Now look, I'm not bragging in this thing, okay? I, we're not saying this for a weird reason. You fixed that already? I actually went to college for battery replacements. You went to college for battery replacements? <laughs> I just appreciate you being my hero. <laughs> Jesus is my savior, but you just saved me. You're number two. <laughs> he went to college for battery replacements. <laughs> you are such a comedian, dude. <laughs> Well, you were, you were taught well. You, you obviously passed the course. You have your degree. Because you did good. Now listen. Now do you notice I don't have a whole tablet of notes up here? I've hidden the word in my heart. Do you know that the word's in my heart? So we're talking and we got all these questions. And I don't have a bunch of text up here notes. I just got... Like I, I did a pastor's conference a while ago. And the one pastor raised his hands and said, Man, dude, can I just have a copy of your notes? And I said, well... <laughs> and we all rolled out of our chairs practically laughing but uh but did you notice how that you know we just know where to go in my spirit because i've put the word in my heart and holy spirit brings so i'm not trying to read my bible to get a store bank of knowledge I'm reading my Bible to know Him and believing that in knowing Him, He'll bring who He is to my remembrance in areas and topics in every time of need. So I just know where to go because it's in my spirit. So I didn't even know where I'm going to be on this topic, but now all of a sudden I know that 2 Corinthians 7 is just the perfect place and there's more and more. We had a conversation on the steps yesterday and Brent and I were talking afterward because I said, man, I love those kind of guys because the word just comes out. It's a sword. And, it's just, and you know, you want to fill your heart with the word. You know what I mean? Because look, if his word is truth and we've been taught by a lie, why not fill our heart with the truth so the light can expose the darkness? And so that the ways we're thinking that aren't God are so exposed by who God is, right? It's just important. But look, here's a simple answer. Second Corinthians 7, forgive me, I am so pumped. <laughs> look, look. Paul wrote the Corinthians a letter. And, and it ended up causing them to repent. Repent means to change the way you think, to change your mind. Repentance isn't, oh, oh, I'm sorry, forgive me, forgive me, God, forgive me. There is churches that have altar calls week after week to, to, to make people aware of their weakness, imperfection, and come up to this altar and get right. And they go up and they're just crying. It's just a cry session, a sin conscious session, hoping and trusting that God has mercy on them. They get up and leave and go back to their chair. And we think God's moving because the altar was packed. What, what are we accomplishing? You're just sin conscious. You're just, <laughs> there's no hope. You're, you're, in fact, you're, you're sure you're going to be back here next week, but thank God. And then you reduce your relationship to God. Thank God there's at least a place to kneel to cry and you'll never reject me. But where's your life ever change? So I don't want to preach the gospel in a way to just promote an altar call where we can cry over our sin and detriment and failure. You follow me? It's not about that. Watch, watch what this says. He came. 
he wrote a letter to him. And he said, well, let's just, let's just read. Verse 2, open your hearts to us. We have wronged no one. We have corrupted no one. We have cheated no one. I don't say this to condemn, for I have said before that you are in our hearts to die together and to live together. Great is my boldness of speech towards you. Great is my boasting. Why? Because he knows his heart and his motive and his life towards them. That's pretty cool. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Outside, uh, there were conflicts. And inside were fears. So there's all these concerns that were trying to rise up. Nevertheless, God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus, earnest desire, uh, uh, by the coming, of, I'm sorry, not only uh, by his coming, but also the consolation with which he was coming, uh, uh, comforting uh, in you when he told us of your earnest desire. So here's a level of comfort Paul's receiving in this conflict and fears. He cares so much about these people that he was comforted by Titus. And when Titus came and shared of their affairs and their state, that brought comfort to Paul because he's selfless. So it comforted him to hear about them, right? Now watch this. Your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. Wow, they're awesome. I'm so glad. You know, and he's excited about that. Now watch. He's, he's writing this because he had previously wrote them a letter correcting them that brought them to repentance. Watch. For even if I made, so he's letting them know, look, I really love you guys. You guys are huge in my heart. When Titus came to me and showed me of your affair, even though I was going through great conflict in my flesh, and even though there was fears trying to rise up in me, I was so comforted knowing that you guys were doing well. Do you hear what he's saying? Now he says, watch. For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I don't regret that I wrote it. Though I did regret it, for I perceive, because when you write it, you know how you say, boy, I hope this isn't too harsh. I don't want to hurt them. Man, I don't know if I should have sent them. I hope they don't just, oh God, please. Who knows we go through that sometimes, right? Now watch. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, but only for a little while. That doesn't mean they only got sorry for a little while and then didn't care anymore. Watch. <laughs> They were always, it just triggered their heart. It just activated their heart in godly sorrow. Watch, this is so cool. That they were, that made them sorry, but only for a little while, for only a while. Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that trigger of sorrow led you to change your mind about the matter. Watch, this is huge. Your sorrow led to repentance because you were made sorry in a godly manner. Not a fleshly awareness and fleshly man. Oh God, forgive me, forgive me. Oh God, forgive me. <laughs> Where's there any hope in that? Where's their vindication? Where's their change? Where's their redemption and permission, uh, forgiveness and remission of sin in that? Watch this. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. Look, for godly sorrow, true godly sorrow, when your heart is in a position of true godly sorrow and you're seeing this thing through truth and, and, and all this right motive and not just introspective, self-concerned, self-consumed, oh me, oh my, and all them other motives. Watch this. Godly sorrow, this is a definition of godly sorrow. Godly sorrow produces repentance. A change of mind that leads to salvation. Salvation, soteria, healing, deliverance, preservation. Kept sound and well and whole. Watch. Not to be regretted. So godly sorrow has nothing to do with regret. Why did I have to go there? Duh, why did I have to say that? Oh, you dummy. Why did you do that? You knew better. You shouldn't have did that. Remember the lady? The 52-year-old the lady that got divorced and came to me and said, I'm not that kind of woman? Look what regret could do to her. Oh my God, I can't believe I had it. Why did I have to go there? I should have known better. Oh, I'm just, I'm not, I'm not. And now I have. Oh, and if I didn't, I wouldn't have. Oh, oh. Where is their help? It's just dumb me, stupid me, bad me. You should have known better. You made your bed. You're sleeping in it. Come on. That's regret. <sighs> For God, you ought to feel what I feel about that. I mean, right? It's the heart of God for people. It's a father's heart. I just like, that is so not God. He is so much bigger than that. God. <laughs> Godly sorrow 
produces repentance leading to salvation not to be regretted but the sorrow of the world see you're in the world but not of the world we don't think the same anymore you can't add psychology to this you can't just rationalize this you can't just say yeah but brother yeah but brother nothing the, the sorrow of the world produces what? death why? because it's consumed by regret And regret ends up judging you, condemning you, shaming you, keeping you guilty, and keeping you eating the fruit of your failure. It's death. Come on, it's right here. Watch. But observe this very thing. That you sorrowed in a godly manner. That means a manner that changed your heart and your mind in that area. And you are not that person anymore. You get it? Yeah. So watch. What diligence it produced in you. All of a sudden you have a diligence. Boy, I'm not going to be lackluster in that area anymore. I'm going to watch and stand guard. And I've become wise. That's what I mean by wiser and sharper now. Right? A diligence. I'm not going to, this is not going to happen. Stance me again. I'm going to be sober, alert, and awake in Christ. Right? Watch. What a clearing of yourself. <laughs> what indignation. I believe that means towards the lie and the deception, etc. Yeah, go ahead. Um, my question is, when, when you're that person and you're sharing that in someone's life, and you can only affect that insofar as what God shares with you, and he says, I don't regret writing this letter because it was God's word for you. Obviously, they still have that choice. So I, I don't want to look at it from a, from a flesh standpoint and from a responsibility standpoint. But if I'm sitting here and I'm writing this letter and I'm filled with God's love and say they got the letter and they were sorrowful and then didn't care anymore. If or that changes, regretted. Or, or, or continued regretting. Or, or didn't or, have this or, outcome. Exactly. How does that where, where do I go from there? I mean, I obviously will just continue to fill myself with God's love. That's an excellent question. You, encourage to, you continue to encourage the people that don't respond this way in the truth. And you don't have to qualify your motive. You have to know what he just said to be responsible. That when you talk to somebody about something, that you're speaking the truth in love. It's not just because you located something wrong in a person. You're not just trying to set somebody straight. You're not just trying to correct somebody. But in your heart, you know that you're sharing what you're sharing for their sake that they might gain. Yeah. It's called love. Yes. Does everybody go, whoa, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. But you have to be sincere in your love. Be sincere without hypocrisy and continue to love. But here's the deal. It's rare that the Lord would tell me not to address many of those things once I see them and do it by love because without a seed planted nothing what so even though somebody doesn't initially respond well it seems you thank God for the privilege of sowing that seed and his continued unfailing love for them that he illuminates things brings so a lot of times to answer your question it's a place of prayer and intercession and this and that and, and then I look for the opportunity to continue to touch encourage and cheer on you see what I mean? Sometimes if you do that, it can seem like you're digging or a, a pest or you're, you, you just need discernment on that. Some you snatch out of the fire. Some you show mercy. You're supposed to know the difference. That's a growing process. And we all make mistakes sometimes. But I promise you, if love's our motive, you'd be amazed how grace covers even your mistakes. Why? Because you sowed as genuine seed. So in a lot of those cases... It would be prayer. Who knows that the Apostle Paul, if they would have totally rejected his letter or got weird or twisted in condemnation, who knows that he would have wrote them probably another letter being in the position he was for one thing. Let's just say he was in that position. Who knows with what we know about Paul, he would have continued to cry out and pray and give thanks for them and speak life over them and declare truth over them and thank God for the seed sown. You follow what I'm saying? So please don't weigh your life by the reaction of others always. Weigh your life by the motive of your heart. A lot of times we think if somebody doesn't react well, we did something wrong. 
I've had people not like me at all for a season. Because they didn't want to hear what I was saying because their heart wasn't in that place. They didn't even want me talking to them. In fact, I'm the kind of fella, the way I am, that, did I answer your question okay? Did you get an answer? Did you, did you okay. I'm the kind of fella that if you're, if you're sincere and you're going after God, you, you'll hang around me, you'll want to talk to me. You want, but if you're not and you have contrary things in your heart, I'm the last person you want to hang around and be with. You might pass by and say hi, but you don't even want to be in a deep conversation with me because you run from a guy like me. It just will. I've learned that in my life. There's people that are seeking God and they'll call me and can call me and once their heart shifts, I won't hear from them at all. Or they give up or they get a little tired or they say, whatever. Man, I won't hear from them at all. And I call them and say, man, you were calling for a while. How you been? I haven't talked to you for a while and I've been getting pursued a lot and stuff but it just hit me. We were talking on a regular basis and you were doing well but I haven't heard from you for a month and a half. And they're stuttering and trying to talk the language and you can tell they're not doing good. And they're not calling because why would they? Because they said, whatever. And I'm the last person they're going to call. And isn't it funny? Now I called them. <laughs> and usually, usually in that case, I, 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 you know, you can say I'm a strong personality or whatever you want to say. I don't believe that. I, I believe I've, I've, I've located love. I understand why I called them back. And I will address things and talk. And usually in that case, those people end up crying hard and making some vows and freshness in God before we hang up the phone. Usually, I could tell you many times where that's happened. Where the best thing was that I tracked them down and called them. Even though it made them a little uncomfortable in the beginning. And I'm okay with that. I don't mind you being a little uncomfortable if I love you. <laughs> you get it? But it's amazing how that works. Where you, people just all of a sudden avoid you. Because of where their soul or their heart is. But if their soul and heart's in your, you're their best friend. And they're actually, they want to be around you and they want to call you and they want to talk to you. So I've, I've experienced that my whole Christian life. Where you either love me or avoid me. <laughs> I seem to be doing pretty good with it. Why? Because I'm not here for you to love me. I want to be your friend. It's cool if you love me. It's not the motive of my life. That's not why I woke up this morning. I woke up to be perfected in love and be able to love you effectively. That's why I'm on the earth. And if I get some other motive, I'm going to get failed, disappointed, and let down in my expectation. I'll just be another hurting person sitting in a church singing spiritual songs. <laughs> Don't let those things shock you when I talk like that. I'm just being real. <laughs> Okay, you guys all right? You all right? It's feels quiet. Observe this very thing. You sorrowed in the godly with diligence, with clearing of yourself, with indignation, what fear. <laughs> you might want to look that one up and just study that one out. That's, that's actually in there on purpose. It doesn't mean frightened. What vehement, look at this. This is what godly sorrow brings you. Repentance. This is what repentance brings you. Diligence, a clearing of yourselves, indignation. Look, what vehement desire and zeal. What a vindication. And in all things, by responding this way, the fruit that shows up on a tree and the way we begin to conduct our lives, watch this. In all things, you prove yourselves to be clear in this matter. <laughs> Why? Because you have the great privilege of repentance and changing your mind is enough. Grace will carry you through. So, so it so trumps the fact of what oh, you did wrong. Do you see that? Oh, and, and then you, it's designed that you love him all the more because you've received this great blessing called redemption and righteousness and forgiveness and mercy. And all of a sudden, the person of God is so magnified in your heart. That's why the devil loves to press people down in sin conscious and guilt and condemnation because they can never see the glory of the nature and the goodness of God in their heart and understanding and draw near to him that way. It's exactly why. Sin consciousness, what a trap. Go back to Romans 6 with me. Now let me try to preach this out. I didn't mind Martha's question. I'm just saying I'm just not going to look up for a while. I'm going to preach this out. I'm not going to get very far. I can tell. 
but I'll do my best. (laughs) Verse 19, I'm just jumping in here. Oh, I can't. Verse 17. Verse 17 is amazing. You know, verse 1 isn't even bad. In fact, chapter 4 is kind of good, Randy. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Serious. I'm not kidding. This is not a joke. Let me read something in uh, Romans 4. It was, it, was, it was on my mind early this morning. Early this morning, because I quoted it yesterday, but I didn't turn you there. That is funny. It says in verse 3 that in Romans 4 that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as what? Righteousness. Now look at verse 4. But to him who works, him who's trying to earn his right standing, then his wages aren't counted as grace but debt. That means he owes God something instead of love and relationship. Now he's just trying to pay off a debt. Pay God back. Oh, you shouldn't have, Lord. Now I'm obligated to live right. How long is that going to last? Hello? Yeah. But to him who does not work, verse 5, but believes, see, we're back to this faith thing, guys, <laughs> but believes on him who justifies. Justified means just as if you've never sinned. But you believe on him who made you just as if you've never sinned. His faith, that one's faith right there, is accounted for righteousness. That's what puts on righteousness. That's a good scripture for, what was her name? Shannon in in Virginia. Is it faith that makes us righteous? Well, it's the finished work of Jesus and the blood of Jesus that opens the door to righteousness, but it's you believing, right? And receiving that grace that makes you righteous, see? So him who doesn't work, he's not trying to produce his righteousness and earn it, but believes on him who justified the ungodly, his faith is accounted as righteousness. Is that amazing or what? What a good scripture. Romans, flip the page, 5, 17. For if by one man's offense, Romans 5, 17, death reigned through the one, we, we quoted this a couple times in the school already, much more those who receive abundance of grace, wow, receive it guys, much more. So, so uh, an offense came, a trespass came, a sin came through one man, Adam, and death swallowed up the earth and reigned through that one man. Much more. Those who receive, so this thing is so about life. It is so, so way beyond death and sin. <laughs> Much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. You have to receive it. You have to say, yes, I qualify, I'm worthy. I'm in your plan, I'm right in line, okay? Not who me, why would you? I can't believe you love me. What? No, you receive it. Will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one man's offense, judgment came through to all men, resulting in condemnation. (laughs) Condemnation, right? Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men result the justification of your life the right to life (laughs) oh this is so good it's ridiculous for as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners that's what you were were so by one man's obedience all were made you can't be both we're going to prove you can't be both We were sinners through the offense, through the just and righteous act of Jesus. We were what? Made righteous. So cancel sinners. Yay! Enter sonship. So did he die because we're sinners or die because we're lost sons? He died to get the sin off of us. The death removed the sin to get to our sonship. He didn't die because we're sinners. He died because we're lost sons. He had to die to remove the sin. Once he removes the sin, he's retained sonship. Come on, that's so sweet. Now that's something nobody ever taught me. Holy Spirit showed me that in the Bible. No preacher ever said that. I've never heard that preached from the pulpit. I always heard he died because I'm a sinner. And when, when that's all you preach, you hold up the identity of sin and the ability to sin. 
No, he died to restore me as a son. He didn't die to expose my sin. He died to remove my sin. He took away sin. He didn't go, ta-da, see, you're a sinner. He died to say you were never created for this. You were created for me, my glory, my image. Now rise up and be a son and receive and believe and be righteous. Okay. <laughs> so sin, eh, sonship, entered. Right? Oh, this is so good. Don't get weary in this. Don't be, think this is redundant. This is the foundation of your life in Christ. If this thing isn't the big deal in your life, you'll be amazed how your heart will stray. And devil will take cheap shots and hit you with them. For it's by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Also by one man's obedient act, many are made righteous. Many will be made righteous. Why? Many will be made. Why? Because it's for those who believe and receive. But his sins were for the whole world. His, his blood was shed for the sins of the whole world. But many will be made righteous. It doesn't say everyone. What it's saying is that not everybody's going to receive, believe, or even see the need for this message. You see it? Wow. Now watch. So just make sure you're, you're in the many. I mean, what is many? Many's many. Many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. So the law tutored us to Christ. It just exposed my need for a Savior. The law made me conscious of the fact that I needed a Savior and be forgiven of sin. Okay? But where sin abounded, so when the law exposed in the sense of right and wrong, and I grew to an age of accountability and I realized I had issues... <laughs> <gasps> and lots of them. Where sin abounded, grace was even greater. Oh my goodness. Okay? Now watch. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what shall we say then? We are in Romans 6, guys. Yay, we crossed the bridge. What shall we say then? Shall we just keep on sinning so God's grace is all over us and everywhere? Watch. Why does he say no? Because we're supposed to bite our lip and be holy and don't you do that? No. Why does he say no? He says certainly not. Why? Because how shall we who... See? Do you see this is not just a forgiveness of sin? It's a transformation of identity. It's from sinners to righteous children of God. We're not trying not to sin. We're enjoying being made sons. So we're not going to continue in the mindset of sin. Certainly not. How shall we who died to the fact that we're sinners? We died. We are alive to the fact that we're sons and daughters redeemed and resurrected through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's not a sin, do sin, don't sin issue. It's a transformation of identity. It's a sonship issue. I raised from the dead. Sin produced unto death. Righteousness unto life. Do you get it? Yes. Come on. This thing is real. How shall we who died to sin just keep living there? (sighs) See? Now he asks the question, or do you not know? Because some people don't know. It's a valid question. Or do you not know? Did you just pray a prayer in hopes to go to heaven? Were you just told that if you come to Jesus, he'll bless you? (sighs) Don't you know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore, if we were buried with him through baptism into death... Well then, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we walk in a newness of life. (laughs) For if we have been united together in the likeness of His death, well then certainly we'll be found in the likeness of His resurrection. Why? Because we know this, that our old man, that person we were, was crucified. He gets real clear in this. Stick with me. The old man was crucified. Now see? Okay. I'm going to challenge your spirit now. It's one thing for me to stand up here and be a wild man and preach this with all my heart and live the benefit of it 
and preach it to you. It's another thing for you to take this and get alone and find the desire, the time, and the heart to get alone and read stuff like this and let Holy Spirit make it yours. How's that for a good, strong challenge? It's one thing to sit here and come under the accountability of knowing this truth. It's another thing for you to take it, have enough hunger and enough sense of seeking God to take this and say, God, enlighten me, make this real to me. Oh my goodness, I am righteous. I want to live in the joy of what it means to be right with you. Because some people, when you preach this, they almost feel like, what's the big deal? Why is everybody excited? Or what's, or what's, you don't want this to just be doctrine and Bible knowledge. Don't let your heart be reduced and held captive to that. You get alone and you start seeking God yourself on this stuff. And you start getting real with your own heart, your own desires, and your own life. And you watch your heart come alive. Now if you don't do that, you're not, you're not compelled. It's not a legalistic thing. But it does make a statement of what we really want, desire, and how hungry we are. What, what do we hunger after? You're judged for your works, not anything else. You're not saved by your works. Your life, your, your life lived is what determines your heartbeat. What you really want is revealed by what you give yourself to and what you pursue. Does this make sense? Come on, that's straight. That's just clean and straight. So if there's an area of my life where my heart doesn't feel like I'm alive in or care much, and I, I, it looks like a big deal scripturally, but I'm not, it's whatever to me, I will ask God to quicken my heart, illuminate me, cause me to see and understand the truth of this, because this is way bigger than I'm seeing. God, thanks for illuminating my eyes. Paul prayed that way to the Ephesians church, that God would give them a spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him, and open them up, and open the eyes of their understanding. After he heard their, they were saved, he prayed that they would see what they're saved for. Isn't that cool? And you can pray the same way. But see, when you seek Him, you find Him. When you draw near, He draws near. Because He wants relationship, not robotic service. You get it? Now watch this. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with Him. Oh my goodness, why? That the body of sin might be done away with. You know what, what other replacement word I have in my Bible? Rendered inoperative. Oh, that the body of sin would be rendered out of order. No more function. Oh my goodness, that's in your Bible. This is all motive. This is all intent from the Lord. That we should... No longer be slaves to sin. Oh my goodness. Of sin. Watch. Now here's the key right here. Now this is a big key. You all pay attention please. For he who has died. See you deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow him. There's a selfless pursuit in the gospel. And we're going to get on it real big. Talking about love and becoming love. That you'll see is imperative to this whole sin issue, sin conscious issue. He who has died, don't pray a prayer to go to heaven, deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow him. You follow me? Because he who has died is what? Freed from sin. I promise you selfishness is the root of all sin. That's why you deny yourself. You were never created for yourself. You're created for the image of God. You're created for the nature of God. You're created for the love of God. The fulfilled work of Christ on the cross is when a man's restored back to love, not when he gets his name in a book. That's the glory of the finished work of Christ. When a man's nature and heart is restored back to love, not when he gets his name in a book. That's the purpose of the cross. Is a new creation. A new man. Born again. It's not a prayer to go to heaven. It's the transformation of life. You getting it? 
It's all through the word. We've made it something else. And we've kept sin consciousness very alive in the process. But he who has died, guess what he is? Free from sin. That's right. He who the Son makes free is what? Free indeed. Now look, now if we died with Christ, see it's not just about dying, it's about living. You die to live. If we died with Christ, we believe, back to belief, we believe we also shall what? Live with him. Now here's something else we need to know, knowing that. Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. That's us too. Never going to die. You get it? Death has no longer any dominion over him. Now look, here he's revealing what it means to be baptized with Christ and buried with him in baptism. He's defining what he died to. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for this issue should be settled. He who knew no sin was made to be sin that you might become the... <laughs> and even if you sin, know you have an advocate, Jesus the righteous, whose merciful plea keeps you free. So when is it ever about your failure? Ever. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> He died, the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives. So his death was all about being made sin. When he raised from the dead, it's all about unto God, name above every name, King of kings, Lord of lords, conquered death, hell in the grave. Got back the keys, right? Oh. so the life he lives he lives what so when we get buried in baptism with him we die to ourselves. we die to sin once for all we die in the likeness of his death we die to sin it's nature it's identity it's sting it's memory it's desire and we say we were never created for sin we were never created for ourselves we were created for the image of God and we come up out of the water a new creation living unto God do you get it? Watch this. Watch this. Likewise. See, the death he died, he died to sin once for all. The life he lives, he lives. Likewise, you also. You see the covenant, the communion, the union. The, the, see, you and him are one. He's not talking about him without talking about you. When he's talking about him, he's talking about you too. <laughs> Likewise, you also. What do you do? Reckon. Oh, my goodness. What other translations do you have out there? Consider? Mm -hmm. What else? Count huh? Count yourself dead. Count on, rely on. Count on, rely on. Count yourself dead. That's awesome. Consider, reckon yourselves to be <laughs> dead indeed to sin. Why do we fight over this topic in the church? Yeah, but brother, you're always going to sin. But what are you saying? You're perfect. Well, if you say you're... Why, why do we promote sin consciousness and fight against the Word of God to maintain in a sin identity? Because the devil's a deceiver. Yes. How's that for a strong comment? You show me where any of that language is here. You got it? It's amazing. You have a question? Comment? That's just the selflessness. And actually when he said that, in a, in, that's how we interpret it. When he said I die daily, he means I face death every day because of the surrender of my life. I'm facing death every day. I've been stone beat. I, I'm dying daily. I, I, well, watch this. But dying daily has nothing to do with sin consciousness. wonder if you take die daily and interpret it this way. It would be totally cool. Every day you just reaffirm that I'm alive unto you, God. Man, I'm dead to myself. I thank you that selfishness has lost its voice forever in my life. Father, I just give my life to you and I thank you. You're going to have your way through me and you're going to shine through me and you're going to love the world through me because I'm alive in you. God, it's another day and it's new mercy and grace and I'm so glad to be alive. I just thank you for life in Christ. Do you get it? It has nothing to do with sin. I die daily it has nothing to do with sin. Oh God, right? It has to do with the privilege of running the race. 
Did you get it? No. I like questions, actually, I do. I, I can tell you I've never been threatened by a question. If I can't answer, I'll just say I don't know. I don't remember saying that. <laughs> just kidding, no, I've said that before, actually. Watch this. Likewise, you also, you also. Is this the, is this the Bible telling you to do this? What are you supposed to reckon yourself and consider yourself and call yourself to be dead to? <laughs> the Bible says to reckon yourself dead to sin. Why are we talking about sinners saved by grace? You were a sinner saved by grace so that you could obtain sonship and live by the Spirit. Ah! <laughs> Why are we fighting a battle that's already won? Come on, this is so clear. Look. Reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now watch. Therefore don't let sin reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in its lust. So there's temptations. There's things that used to own you that'll whisper. There's things that, well, you know you want to go here. Well, you just want to do that. Well, you just would like that. Well, you just would, yeah, shut up. Right, watch what he's saying. What he's saying is, if you don't reckon yourself dead to sin and alive unto God, if you don't continue in this place of knowing your old man's dead, and Father, and just walking, that could be that die daily thing she said. I have no problem with the... See, I, I died. I don't die daily. I died. But if I reaffirm that death in my prayer so that life is sustained, that's, that's okay. Do you see what I'm saying? But, but in my heart, I died. And now I live. So I'm not getting technical with it or theological. If you want to every day affirm that and keep that building in you to where that becomes a stronghold of God, so be it. That's totally cool. And some of us probably would be healthy to even do that just to really see and stay conscious, right? Because watch, if this is the truth, then don't let sin just ravage and run in your life and see. Because if you are, then the question is, do you really see you're dead to sin and sin has no dominion over you? Do you really understand you were crucified and dead, etc.? Do you see who you've become because of this? Because see, when you start letting sin just reign in your body, say, oh, well, this is who we are, brother. Well, God knows my heart. Well, that's what, well, you know, I got that thing hiding in me. It's just my nature. Then it puts all this gospel truth in question of what you see, believe, agree with, or even understand. Because he says, or don't you know? Or don't you know? What he's saying is, well, if you really know this, then sin's not just going to reap havoc and drive your life. That's what he's saying. This isn't a legalistic thing. Well, then make sure that you don't sin now. What he's saying is, don't let sin just reign in your life because then everything you're saying you believe is in question. You're going to mess up your own conscience and your own soul. And you'll mess up people around you, especially young Christians. Or people that are looking for an occasion for the flesh. Who knows there's people that are actually looking for an occasion for the flesh? Who knows there's people sitting on hurt, sitting on hurt, sitting on hurt, sitting on hurt. And all of a sudden their hurt gains a voice and a desire and a temptation. But they got the gospel speaking too. And the hurts, the hurt, the hurt. <sighs> And they know what's right, but they hurt. And they know what's right. And they know they shouldn't be hurt, but they're hurt. And they have a right to be hurt. And they don't deal with that. And all of a sudden, well, so and so. Well, and all of a sudden, they find a way to fulfill their hurt in the face of truth. Now, I've seen that way too much as a pastor. And I've watched people come back hurting all the more because they followed their hurt. Coming back broken, weeping, crying, ashamed, guilty lost some of them years of their life. It's true. You follow me? Watch this. Oh my gosh. It's 12 o'clock. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> I'm done. You know what's good? This is going to be in here tomorrow. You know what else? It's going to say the same. And you're going to be here, I hope. But I know I will. And we're going to have fun. Okay? Stand your feet. Let's do that. Let's stand your feet and honor Jesus. Who wants to close in prayer and bless this time in prayer? Who be bold and just come up here and just bless everybody in prayer? Who wants to do that? Who would do that? Come on, man. Thank you. Yeah, run up the... Thanks, buddy. Yeah, he give you the mic.